ये सी तो चला गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन एंड वॉम वेलकम होप यू ऑल आर डूइंग वेल एंड सेफ आई एम डॉक्टर नितिन शर्मा हेड एंड नेक सर्जन एट एच सी जी कैंसर सेंटर अहमदाबाद टूडे आई हैव प्रिवेज टू बी योर होस्ट एंड आई वेलकम यू ऑल ऑन द बिहाफ ऑफ एंटायर टीम ऑफ ऑनको सर्जरी मास्टर कोर्स सिक्स वेबिनार्स लाइक कोविड हैज बिकम न्यू नॉर्मल मोस्टली डीलिंग विद uh theoretical topics to break this chain this time in the in this sixth edition of onco surgery master course we have decided to take a separate path uh to host a confession series the lesser known path of exploring the complication in head and neck surgery as expected the registration numbers have already hit 1500 plus and still we are counting we have very good enthusiastic participation from all over the world this has become possible by the committed effort of the fantastic team onco surgery master course 6 that i am going to introduce to you this onco surgery master course series took off before 6 years with the vision of dr kostu patel and dr rajendra toprani and they are beacons whose light shines bright over event as their as the organizing chairman the course is conceptualized by course directors dr dushyant mandik and dr dakshesh patel the clock work and precision management by organizing secretaries dr parin patel and dr aditya joshi pura the science of the event our wonderful scientific committee dr purvi patel myself dr nitin sharma uh, dr dhanush gohil dr ashesha and dr mitesh patel for design conceptualization and coordination we thank mr sanjeev dhawan the man of ideas from amdavad cancer foundation friends let me explain some rules of the engagement in order to to conduct the smooth session where the views of the dignitaries are heard the attendees will be muted all questions are to be posted in the chat group out of which the relevant ones will be forwarded to moderator or speaker and the questions will be answered there will be two lectures by senior faculties which will be followed by an expert panel discussion moderated by the master so friends we have ample amount of time you can ask as many as questions you want and everyone will be answered we expect your patience friends this is a series of six saturdays taking up one sub specialty of head and neck each time out of which this is the fifth episode now i will hand over the program to my colleague dr ashay dr ashay will introduce to you for with faculties dr ashay yes thank you very much uh, dr nitin sharma uh, a very good evening to everyone uh, i am dr ashay shah i am a head and neck cancer surgeon in hcg cancer center amdabad and once again i welcome you all on behalf of uh, team om 6.0 so uh, today we will be uh, dealing with the complications associated with the surgery that has widened the horizons of head and neck resection and improved functional and uh, cosmetic outcomes and that's why complications can have huge impact on the overall quality of life of patients as well as doctors so to open our session we have veteran of the field dr sandeep mehta with us uh, he is a plastic and reconstructive surgeon who is associated with uh, uh, many apex institutes of india and he has performed more than 15000 cancer reconstructive surgeries Uh, he has done pioneer work with super micro surgery in preemptive lymphovenous anastomosis for prevention of lymphedema so uh, we are delighted to kick off our session uh, uh, of om 6 so sandeep sir sandeep your voice is muted i think you need to be muted okay Uh, am i audible now yes yes sir yes, you are audible sir thank you dr nitin and dr ashay and thank you dr kostu for making it possible to me to be here with you all and i think we can start the session may be allowed to have the screen sharing please
I would be actually dealing with complications in the local and the regional flaps. And to that effect, uh, it will be something of uh, more value in the present COVID era where long surgeries seem to be a little off the beat. When we talk about complications, we need to have a very clear cut definition about them. It's a secondary disease or condition which aggravates the already existing one. And so when we are dealing with complication, we are not only dealing the technical aspect of it, but also we need to do a lot of dealing with the patient and the family, which most of us learn with time and has to have more of a human face than the technical skills they demand. The common complications that come across any surgery, the hematomas, the bleeding, infection, seroma, and delayed wound healing is also part of the reconstruction. But specifically when the reconstruction is added to the head and neck surgery, it's the flap failure which comes to the fore. And when there is a flap failure, the most common thing that comes to the mind is a fistula formation, a delayed wound healing, which delays a adjuvant therapy, which increases the chances of recurrence, and finally leads to a poor functional outcome and a poor quality life. Rare circumstances would be when the flap failure leads to death because of secondary hemorrhage or a carotid blowout. I would be dealing with certain key flaps which are commonly used as the regional and local flaps, PMC being the regional one, and the local flaps would be either forehead, temporalis, nasolabial, the submental, and the subclavicular, supraclavicular. Something which is very common to all the flaps and especially the pedicle ones, it applies to universally in the foreground that whenever we choose a flap, we need to see that it's of the appropriate size restricted to its vascular territory. It's, it's like a, a demand of a site of reconstruction does not actually increases the size of the flap at that point of time. The common Philosophy that is there whenever we are handling a tissue which has to be transferred is that you treat it like a baby. So you have to avoid sharp bends or kinks, see that it is well relaxed. And there should be no pressure on the pedicle when you are actually doing the dressings. The suture should be tension free. And whenever you find any seromas or hematomas, see that in the area where it is very relevant, especially around the pedicle, if we can really evacuate them as early as possible. And there is a very typical aspect of pedicle flaps that they would not seem to be failing in the initial days. First three to five days, they would almost look normal, but then things start failing out. And then we have to be wary about that these flaps can even fail later on. Coming on to the pectoralis major myocardial flap, it's one of the hardiest, the workhorse, because of its constant vascular anatomy. It has a good reach to the oropharyngeal defects. It has Technically easy to raise and almost everybody masters it well. It consumes less time and provides a good muscle to the neck as well so that it covers not only the cavity to which it is reaching for reconstruction, but also covers the neck where it is passing through. And we can have a large flap for both intraoral and extraoral covers. But then there are certain disadvantages that it is bulky. It needs meticulous planning. This is something which I'll be highlighting later on. And definitely in the females, it is difficult and adds to little more complications. There are certain other less important complications like hair growth and a band formation in the neck, which can also be dealt with. When we talk about complications for pectoralis major, there are large number of studies with very widely varying figures because the complications that they collaborate together would be as minor as a sutured hastens, but still, I will go through certain key articles and the key studies that have been published in the initial period, which spanned almost similar number of cases. The complication rate in them ranged from 40 to 63%, but only one fourth of them, that is only 26% of the whole cases required any revision procedures. The first and foremost of them is a study from Tata Memorial in the year 1996, where the flaps were studied over a period of a year between 1990 and 1991. Total number of flaps were around 220 and the overall complication rate was 40.5%. The most common of them which came out to be was a flap necrosis that was around 27.3% and mostly so the partial and total necrosis only took place in 2.7% cases. Fistula happened in 12.7%, dehiscence was around 15%. 
and 20% had infection. The hematoma at the donor site was around 2.5%, whereas in the neck was around 2%. And mind you, 40% of these on exploration were negative for any active bleeders. Coming to another surgery, almost at the same time, with similar number of flaps was from the MSKC Center in New York. And this also had around 214 flaps in 211 cases, but this was a study stage over 10 year period. And they had a flap necrosis rate of around 32% with a fistula of around 29% and almost similar other parameters. But when we look at the larger picture of this whole issue, we find that even smaller incidence of any disruption comes as an indication of a complication with the flap. Whereas if you look into the overall management of these complications, more than 80% would not require any active management. The risks which are associated, which lead to complications is pectoralis major flaps. Mostly it is the female sex, age of about 70. And especially so when the reconstruction is being done for major glossectomies and for hypopharyngeal defects, whether they are tubed or even as a patch. Following radiation, chemotherapy, and any resurgery, the risk also is higher. And the complications definitely added with the obesity and diabetes with hypertension having at its severity. Whenever a bipedal flap is raised, there is always increased risk of complications. Coming to management as a nutshell, as I already said, more than 70 to 80% would be dealt with conservatively. Only one fourth of them would require any surgical intervention, which would be in the form of minimal debridement, secondary suturing, evacuation of hematoma, and at the most skin grafting because most of the time, not all the components of the flap are lost and one may get away with just doing skin grafting of the left tissue where the granulation tissues appear. Second flap is very rarely required, hardly in two to 3% cases. When we look at the management of complications, one looks at necrosis, which is in the marginal areas, distal edges, and limited to an extra oral component of a double flap, the best strategy is to wait and watch. And this should at least stretch for two to three weeks because most of the time we find that the, the congestion that is seen in the earlier phases just clears out over a period of time. That is the inherent uh, microcirculation of the flap which gets adjusted to the ischemia that has taken place. So we should not hurry up in doing any debridement for such cases where there is no risk of exposure to any inner vital structure or any implant. But when we see that there is an intraoral necrosis, but there is an intact suture line, there is no salivary leak in the neck, drains are clear, do not, still do not debride immediately. One has to have a little more patience with that. Just do a support contour bandage, see that the neck flaps adhere very well and the risk of contamination from the oral cavity, even if it has say a micro leak from the suture line because it is having necrosis would be minimized. Other thing is when we have a, can I have the screen limited to this? Okay. But when definitely we have a dehiscence at the suture line, we should, and the flaps are viable, we should go ahead and do the suturing as soon as possible. One should not wait any more time for that. A stitch in time saves nine. The most dreaded of the complication is when we have a necrosis in the oral cavity and dehiscence and salivary leak in the neck. And that's an orocutaneous fistula or a pharyngocutaneous fistula. The immediate action should be to precipitate the drainage from the neck wound, see that the skin opening is large enough. We can either replace the tube drain with a uh, corrugated drain or do start doing the packing with the Vaseline gauze two to three times a day so that nothing gets collected inside. Debride the tissue very conservatively, but if you find that any vascular tissue is getting exposed, best thing is to plan a flap immediately and let the patient be on RT feed for longer time. These are certain tips when we are doing a preemptive cover for a laryngeal closure, which is a post salvage laryngectomy. And we need to use a pectoralis major muscle to cover it. Uh, ideally, we just cover the area which has been closed with the muscle. 
but I would like to add certain points here is where we need to do a tacking of the sutures from the prevertebral fascia to the undersurface of the muscle, almost isolating the whole muscle, uh, is uh, isolating the whole repair from the carotids in the lateral aspect. At the same time, also make a point of attaching the muscles at the supramohyoid group of muscles so that this flap stays in place. The basic premise for enhancing the reliability of the pec major flap is to do a proper planning. And for that, any plastic surgeon would always advise a reverse planning. Reverse planning means that the fulcrum of your flap, which is a pedicle flap, should be very well planned so that it reaches the defect in a most relaxed manner. To that, I would say that even today, one should not find it, uh, uh, I would say it should not be coming to someone's uh, disgrace that if we have to do all these plannings in every bit of the case, because there are certain minute points which come to light when we do these kinds of maneuver. Here we see that the flap lie has changed almost by 90 degrees or else we would have taken the flap longitudinally. Otherwise, this is 90 degrees at angulation to the pedicle. Whenever we raise pedicle flaps, uh, sorry, whenever we are raising the pec major flap, I would suggest to divide the clavicle head, which increases its reach so that the pedicle remains relaxed. The deltoid and the acromial branches of the thoracoacromial axis should always be ligated. It not only increases the reach of the flap, but also enhances the supply to the pectoral branch. The denervation of the muscle, uh, nerve which is supplying the pedicle adds to the autoregulation of the flap. This has been uh, very much supported by Lorenzetti's work for microcirculation and autoregulation of the flap, which suggests that a denervated flap will have autoregulation in case there is an ischemia because of kinking of the pedicle or by any other pressure means. So much so that it adjusts to 70 to 80% of reduction in its blood flow. Hence, it's better to denervate the flap. At the same time, it will also cause the atrophy of the muscle and reduce the bulk, which is not very good cosmetically. There are certain vascular branches which are near the pedicle, which uh, I mentioned them as the feet of the pedicle. They also should be ligated off or else they would cause bleeding and pressure on the pedicle. Now, coming on to the lie of the pedicle when we are raising large flaps. The issue is that they should lie over the third and fourth perforator. And when a double pedal flap of a larger size is to be used, it is best to have a transverse orientation of the flap. This not only increases the reach of this flap, but also enhances its blood supply, as we see in the representative case. In females, where we are very much afraid about the vascularity, at the same time also the disfigurement of the breast, uh, this is the strategy one should adopt. The pedal should be parasternal, including the third and fourth intercostal. It may even lie over the breastbone a little bit. At the same time, as the flap here that is planned is CDE, there is another flap which is now being lifted from the lateral aspect of the breast, which is based on the second intercostal perforator, the flap ABC. This is the flap which will be turned into the defect so as to minimize the deformity of the breast. This is the flap which has been elevated and tunneled to the neck. The lateral flap from the lateral aspect of the breast has been lifted and it is turned on that side. And this covers the donor defect. The defect covered inside the cav oral cavity and that's the final result. Now, when we look at the issue of flap survival, we also need to look at there are other reasons which may also cause complications which are not actually to the vascularity of the flap. And these can very well be uh, circumvented by giving some proper directions to the way we do the flap inset and take control of what functional unit we are reconstructing, whether we are making a microstroma or a macrostroma, or we should restrict ourselves to a normal stroma. The oral competence, and even there is a a guide to do a primary animation in these cases. And last but not the least, to get the right contours at the right places. We find that the flap is always been earmarked for being very bulky, 
but it loses certain areas where it should give its bulk. That is especially in the intra infratemporal fossa and a pre uh, and the parotido mesoteric areas. We keep talking a lot about the bony reconstructions when we look at the mandibular reconstruction. We forget that it is actually the soft tissues which are more important for the survival of these uh, bony and the skeleton reconstructions. And the technique of the flap in setting its contouring and suturing has also need to be looked into. And the proper allowance should be given for atrophy and the post addition changes that these flaps undergo. Complications of reconstructions are more often due to soft tissue issues than others. And that is the reason when our implants also fail and that's how we need to take care of them. So method of suturing and insetting, it should also be looked into. Wrapping of the hardware, filling the dead spaces. And if possible, one should also start the animation strategies immediately at the first go of reconstruction. This is where one should look into when we are inserting the flap close to the cut edge of the bone, where there is a tooth and a gingiva available. And I would suggest using a half bursting suture which passes through the interdental, interdental space and goes subcortical to the flap so that there is a water tight closure there. And this suture can be either of uh, proline or it can be uh, PDS or simply vicryl, but something which has to stand the test of time for at least three weeks. Another aspect that I would like to add is that whenever possible, try to preserve the parotid duct, do a cannulation and relocate it rather than just ligating it off when it is cut. This prevents the post-operative seroma and parotitis to a large degree. When we say the insetting of the flap, it is not just the skin alone, but a lot of things have to be managed for the pec major muscle part, which has to be hitched to the zygomatic periosteum to the digastric tendon from the inside, the masseteric muscle laterally, the mandible periosteum, or even with the drills through the bone at the cut edge of the mandible. And lower in the neck, it should be spread flat so as to cover the whole of the neck so that no band formation takes place in the later course of events. Whenever there is a palatal inset of the flap, one should try to pass certain bony sutures through the uh, drilled holes and do a subcutaneous suturing of these flaps or else we'll end up with a fistula. In some cases where we are using large flaps and the double paddle is to be used for the extra oral defect, there is no harm in leaving the outer inset for a later date because immediately turning the flap to such contours would ultimately jeopardize its vascularity. So many a times I have the sense of advising to leave behind the outer pedal half inset so that there is no complete uh, congestion to the outer pedal. Now coming on to the aspect of plates and, and the soft tissues as we use the combination, the exposure rate of these implants is around 22% when it is uh, taken into consideration with the soft tissue flap segments. This is not only with the pec major, it is all soft tissue flaps combined with any kind of plate bridging system. Very rarely it fails at the lateral aspect. More commonly it fails in the central aspect because of the soft tissue cutting through and the overlying skin getting cicatrized and passing through the implants. At the same time, we should also deal with the oral competence and aesthetics of the control field, which will enhance the outcome of these flaps. It has been very well documented now that obliteration of the dead space medial to the plate decreases the overall plate extrusion by around 20%. It comes down to almost 8% from 32%. In the same way, because we find that the osteocutaneous flaps, when they are used, they have only 10% extrusion rate because there is a good vascular tissue behind the plate, which is now not letting any dead spaces to occur. So what we need to do is whenever we have a plate and flap combination, always try to suture the defect above the plate by approximating the muscle to the floor of the mouth muscle groups 
so that there is no space left above the implants. And at the same time, get every bit of the implant covered by the muscle hitched onto with non-absorbable sutures. Similarly, this is the area where most of the defect is left unattended to. We still have a lot of muscle, but we don't put it in the right place. And that is where seroma takes place or hematoma occurs. And finally, this is where there will be contour deformity and lead to much cicatrization of the flap, which will cause exposure of the plate. The other method is that we can use the, as the tissues of the flap itself, the dermal component of the flap itself to fill these defects. This is a deep slice segment of the proximal segment of the pec major, which is being used to fill the ITF defect. Once that is done, the another part of this flap, which is now being rolled over the implant is deep sliced and used to cover the plate completely so that we have a second layer of cover over the implant. This is much so required because most of the time we find that uh, because of some exigencies of excision, the overlying cheek skin has got a uh, very precarious blood supply, more so because of ligation of the facial artery or the other blood vessel because of the tumor presence. And so this may be at jeopardy. This ensures that we have an intact second layer of skin inside and it gives a good contour and would also withstand any radiotherapy. Coming to the commissure challenge, should we end up with a microstomia when we have a lip loss and do a secondary correction or we should do a macrostomia and still do a secondary reconstruction? I would suggest, why don't we do a primary reconstruction straight away? We can use a facial atta sling, use it to put it across the commissure and do a primary animation here. Similarly, we can also do these things on table with finer aspects as we would do it for a free flap. And these are the post-operative and post-radiation results, which is quite encouraging. Now, when we put our case with PMC versus cutaneous free flaps for the hypopharyngeal defects, that is where most of these flaps have increased morbidity, we find that PEC major has a complication rate of around 57% versus 22% with when it is compared to ALT and the radial artery forearm flaps. But the morbidity to the patient is almost half as compared to what it is with the free flaps. So should we not have this case when we say that there is enhanced morbidity of pectoralis major microtense flap, which has been used for salvage in failed oncological treatment, is that because it has already been used in very trying circumstances. Also with much advancement and the technical skill that, has, that is now being put for use in the pec major reconstructions, the flap related complication has come down to almost 22% and total necrosis is less than 1%. Most of the series these days, they say there has been never a total necrosis of the flap. So it should be taken into consideration that PMC flaps were usually selected to shorten the operative duration due to a poor general condition caused by severe comorbidities. And these comorbidities may exist even with free flap surgery, but the severity being more, they, they actually uh, are the choice of flap at that point of time. And so the, dis the advantage of the PMC with regards to lower medical morbidity should not be undervalued. Now we come to the other aspects of the local flaps, the other flaps, the nasolabial flap being the most common one which is used. It's a simple flap, less time consuming, reliable, and the donor site is very well within the field of the surgery and gives a very good skin match to the surface lesions. But Things against it is that it has a facial scar. It has a very limited width, not more than four centimeter. And it grows here when it is took, taken inside the mouth. The results may not be at that happy all the time. We may have sinuses. We may have bad scars, trapdoor deformities, partial necrosis, or hair inside the mouth. See, overall incidence of necrosis is not more than five to 6%, whether it's partial or total. Sinus formation is much commoner, up to 12%. And orocutaneous fistula per se is not very common. It's just 1.2%. And the donor site scar, which may be unacceptable to people, is less than 13% or so. But yes, the incidence of any complication that arises from 
a nasolabial flap, because it has been used only for small defects, could be left to heal by secondary intentions. So very rarely a second flap or a second uh, uh, sort of a redo surgery is required in such cases. Now, when we have to do some specific understanding of this flap, we look at its use when a facial artery is ligated in the neck. Can we still use the nasolabial flap? Or it would cause necrosis of this flap when there has been facial artery sacrifice. Well, even when the facial artery has been ligated, we still have another th other three arteries which supply the flap, which is the transverse facial, there is the infraorbital, and also there will be the contralateral facial supplying it. So if we restrict ourselves to certain guiding principles of the anatomy, we, we see that the flap, the inferiorly based flap is not taken below the line from the modulus to the lobule attachment to the cheek, the flap will always have a good supply. Flap should always be elevated in a supramuscular plane so as to preserve all the facial nerves. And it should be deep sliced up to the follicle depth to prevent any growth of hair tuft or sinus formation. And the outline of the islanded flap should be rhomboid so that the closure is elliptical. And when closing the donor site, one should always restrict to mobilizing the lateral cheek only and always put a drain so that there is no black eye formation. When my inset is being planned for nasolabial, because it has a very high tendency of trap door formation, see that both the inset and the flap are stretched almost to the same tension and stitched accordingly. Coming on to the forehead flap, the forehead and a combination of the glabral flap. The supply is mainly by the supratrochlear vessel. The dimensions are restricted by how much we can close primarily. Older the patient, we can take a larger flap. Almost the whole nose can be reconstructed with one go. It is usually a two-stage procedure where the pedicle needs to be divided, but has a very reliable vascularity, which can be on either side. And has a good color match for the surface lesions of the face. The scar becomes conspicuous conspicuously obscure because of the forehead furrows. Now, coming to certain examples, this is the defect of a lacrimal gland tumor with a loss of the medial canthus, the upper eyelid and lower eyelid, which has been covered using a fogged forehead flap, which gives a very acceptable result. But there can be certain occasions when we have a nasoethmoidal tumor, which has been excised and then subjected to radiotherapy and that ends up with a naso, nasocutaneous fistula. In such cases, a modification of a glabral flap is very much to be used, where we can take an extension of the galea along with the glabral flap and use it to fill the defect inside. And so this should be our plan initially, whenever we are planning defects, which have got a cavitation defect and a simple cover on the surface would not suffice. These flaps are very hardy and they sustain the radiotherapy quite well. Coming on to the supraclavicular artery island flap, the supply is from the transverse cervical. It's a reliable vascularity. The anatomical landmarks are very critical and one should stay within it so as to raise a flap which is quite thin, pliable, but the most of the pedicle is formed by a deep thalai segment. The reach of this flap has to be very well planned in reverse and so one should be very sure about the fulcrum. That is the point where the wet vessel is actually entering the flap. This disadvantage associated with it is that the donor site leaves behind a scar, which is likely to hypertrophy. And sometimes it may need a skin graft. Just an example to show that how much of this flap needs to be deep sliced, the long segment of the pedicle to just supply around five by five centimeter of defect in the oral cavity. <coughs> Sorry. The flap necrosis associated with supraglavular flap is around 4 to 15 percent limited to its tip. And that also happens if the flap has been more than 22 centimeter long. So that is one catch in its length. One has to be very sure about the measurement and the fulcrum of its reach. The dehiscence, which is most common and most troublesome when it is used for a hypopharyngeal reconstruction, happens with salivary fistula in 6 to 17% of cases. 
and in that one has to be very sure as to how much of the edge is depthalized when suturing for the hypopharyngeal defect. The donor side hypertrophy and widening, one has to limit itself to not more than five to six centimeter in its width. Any complex or maybe one, the more than one subsite is being involved and which involves the flap to be contoured along that would have adverse effect on its outcome. Smoking also is much associated with uh, much higher rates of necrosis and nodes at the level four and lower five would always leave some, uh, I would say, skepticism as to whether this flap was really to be indicated. But the idea where we have to look into is whether we can take this flap even in such cases where these nodes have to be dissected if we restrict ourselves by not dissecting the fibrofatty tissue, which is just medial to the anterior border of the trapezius. We can use a Doppler or even CT angio has been used by people to know as to exact site of the vessel and then go ahead with such kind of dissections. So how do we avoid these complications? We can identify the supraclavicular artery by Doppler or by CT angio when the neck has been previously dissected. Avoid the dissection medial to trapezius. The passage under any skin tunnel should be as lax as possible and definitely reverse planning that the defect should not be more than 22 centimeter away from its fulcrum should be adhered to with a minimum with a maximum width of around five centimeters. Coming on to the submental flap, it is based on the submental branch of the facial artery. The most important aspect is that the vein penis drainage should be preserved very well. And this is the flap which would fail only because of its venous congestion. The anterior belly of diagnostic should always be it should always be included because the perforators come through it. And this flap needs to be harvested before the neck dissection is done. Then there is always a question mark with level one and B dissections with its oncological safety and the flap. So that flap may not be of use when these nodes are positive. It's a very hairy flap. And so in males, it's a big no-no. This is certain, just an example to show a defect at the angle of the mouth with the buccal mucosa and the outer skin. A flap has been elevated and both intraoral and extraoral defect has been covered. Very healthy looking donor side defect, which is very inconspicuous. That's the positive aspect of this flap. But yes, it has complications related to marginal mandibular nerve, which runs around zero to 17%. So some people have even advocated doing a supraplatysmal submental artery perforatal flap, which would uh, minimize the risk to the marginal mandible nerve, but that becomes very technically demanding. Venous congestion is around 5% in these flaps. So one should always preserve the anterior jugular vein when it is being divided at the anterior edge of the anterior belly of diagastric, which may be of use to be anastomos if we find this flap has congestion when it is transferred inside the oral cavity. And this vein can be used as the donor vein. The necrosis, which is mostly partial, is limited to 0 to 5%. And intraoral hair growth definitely is one of the complications which we cannot avoid. It can always be treated by some lasers or by epilation, but it is too big a issue for such dense hair growth. The risk factors associated are any node positive neck. We will not be doing the submental flap any previous neck dissection or radiation to the neck, these flaps would ultimately end up with venous congestion. And there may be a ground for doing a Doppler assessment of the venous circulation in these cases, but still that would be a high risk. Incorporation of anterior belly of diagnostic should always be encouraged and anterior jugular vein should always be preserved when the flap is being elevated. A word about the temporalis muscle flap, it's a robust, flap with good blood supply, which is ensconed with the muscle and the bone. It is mostly used as a filler flap, but definitely has a donor side contour defect. Necrosis is very rare. Total necrosis is very rare. If the dehiscence is more common, up to 7%. And many a times it is left to epithelize as a secondary thing. And that becomes delayed because of either dehiscence so I would suggest that one should always make a case of putting a skin graft on the surface of the muscle, which is being used for intraoral defects. 
it has a poor reach to the opposite palate, which can be enhanced by a technique of including the pericanium and the galial fringe. The injury to the temporal branch of the facial nerve has always to be avoided by not venturing into the fat pad above the zygomatic arch. And there is a great amount of difficulty encountered when passing this flap under an intact zygoma. I don't advocate cutting the zygoma just for the purpose of passing this flap. One has to be a little diligent and one can always do that. So these are certain points. Always take a fringe of pericranium attached at its outer most limit. Also a border of the galea, which is the temporoparietal fascia. Both of these maintain the attachment of the muscle in the original form and so this attachment to any part of the defect would be very stable. The temporoparietal fascia which has been dissected off should be preserved for its full entirety because that would be then put back to decrease the contour defect. And a word about this pad of fat which is always seen at the upper border of the zygomatic arch. If we don't go into this pad of fat below the zygoma, the temporal branch of facial will never be injured. I'll just skip this anesthesia consideration because this would not concern us much. And come to the conclusion that when we reach the end of what we should know, will be, it will be the beginning of what we start sensing. And that is what is the sixth sense when we say about anything that, oh, this will do well. So if a person wins without any trouble, that is victory. But if one wins with a lot of trouble, that is history. I hope I was informative enough and I will hand over the charge to the organizers and thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sandeep, sir, for this practical and in-depth excellent talk. Uh, I think we will take up the questions after our uh, second talk. So uh, let's quickly move on to our uh, second talk. And the second speaker I would like to introduce is very dynamic, uh, Dr. Deepak Balasubramaniam. Uh, he is Associate Professor at uh, Amrita Institute of Medical Science, Kochi, uh, in the Department of Head and Neck Surgery and Oncology. Uh, he participates in the entire length and breadth of head and neck uh, cancer surgery as well as reconstructive surgery. And he is very active uh, in academics also with numerous papers, chapters and reviews to his name. So um, may I uh, please invite Dr. Deepak. Uh, over to you, Deepak, sir. Yeah, I'm just going to share the PPT. Is the PPT? Yes, yes, it's visible, sir. Go ahead, sir. In everyone's screen. So at the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. And it's always humbling to do a presentation after Sandeep sir, because uh, you know his presentations are full of pictures and practical tips on how to get by uh, you know, doing flaps and the complications of flaps. The, the topic that was given to me was complications in free flap surgery. And a lot of the you know, the uh, practical complications that you would encounter in terms of dehiscence and hardware exposure or contour deformities, uh, uh, Sandeep has already spoken to you and the principles are more or less the same. I'm gonna be speaking specifically on what happens during free flap surgery, how to anticipate problems in microvascular anastomosis, how to get by or solve those problems during microvascular anastomosis and briefly look at, you know, donor site morbidity and uh, how you, you know, execute flaps uh, when you're planning to reconstruct head neck defects. So it is very clear that uh, free flap microsurgery has revolutionized head neck reconstruction over the last three decades. And it's very safe and effective. You know, the high volume centers have a flap success rate of more than 95%. And we are not limited by the, uh, the defect anymore. Even complex three-dimensional defects, large defects, uh, can be safely reconstructed, provided we understand the limits of the flaps that we harvest. The surgical principles have remained the same. Uh, new flaps have been described, but the surgical principles for the three workhorse flaps, that is the uh, radial forearm, the ALT, and the fibular flap has always remained the same. One should remember that this is an all or none phenomena. Either the free flap works in its entirety or the free flap doesn't work. So that uh, point specifically is for the microvascular anastomosis. So either the anastomosis work or works or the anastomosis does not work. And we need to pay you know, critical attention to that. Management of complications is essential learning because uh, if you have a failed flap, you should always be in a position to redo the flap 
If you run into a complication with the anastomosis, you should be able to correct the complication. So learning how to manage these complications is very essential. And when you do free flap surgery, always have a plan B in mind, because in spite of your best efforts and you know astute uh, operating and meticulous surgery, we might still end up losing the flap. So always have a plan B in mind and don't burn all your bridges. So for successful free flap surgery, uh, we have like the, the common goal would be to have an anatomical and functional restoration. That would be the aim of any free flap surgery. But what is under the, uh, what is important to get the anatomical and functional restoration is to have proper anastomotic technique. If you know how to do the anastomosis correctly, your flap will survive. And also understanding flap uh, physiology and ischemia time. I'm not going to go into the depths of how you harvest an ALT or a fibula or a radial forearm, but we all should understand that there are physical uh, constraints and how much of muscle or tissue that we can harvest along with a free flap. And more importantly is to understand this concept of ischemia time. So all of the tissues, once we ligate it from the donor area, all of them can withstand uh, ischemia for varying du durations of time. And the ischemia tolerance depends upon the energy requirement of the tissue and the duration of the ischemia. So some tissues, for example, muscle, viscera, have very low ischemia times. Whereas if you look at bone and skin, they probably have higher ischemia times. But it doesn't mean that if you have a tissue which can tolerate ischemia better, you can do the procedure slower or you can take your time doing the anastomosis. If you limit the ischemia time sufficiently, you're going to end up having fewer complications than uh, ending up with major complications. And what happens is when you have short duration ischemia, there's a lot of adaptive responses uh, which happen within the tissue. Um, there's a lot of uh, activation of cell survival programs. And basically the tissue can revert to its uh, functional state or to its anatomical state once the ischemia is, is, um, is removed. But the longer you prolong the ischemia, the cellular dysfunction becomes permanent. Uh, there is tissue death and this makes the flap non-viable. So always remember, different tissues have different ischemia times and you try to do the anastomosis and get the flap perfused as soon as possible. So what are the complications that we can have during free flap microsurgery? So you can have intra-op complications, you can have immediate post-op complications, and you can have delayed complications. The intra-op complication is always uh, due to either the anastomotic technique or the Pro, you know, uh, problems within the vessel itself. Patients can have different types of vessel pathology. And there are a wide variety of reasons for that. You can have arterial problems, you can have venous problems, you can have vessel orientation problems, you can have external compression of the pedicle, or you might have inadequate length of the pedicle, thereby causing you to do uh, anastomosis under tension, which is not a good thing to do. So the most of the problems are because of the anastomosis and the technique of anastomosis. And uh, in certain patients, uh, we always have other problems that you have to think of. For example, intravascular pathology. So anticipation is the key here. Um, what we commonly see as problems within the vessels are atherosclerosis, you might see intimal dissections, and you might see thickened or calcified walls. Now, there are some warning signs. For example, patients with hypertension, diabetes, uh, peripheral vascular disease, and smoking. These patients have a higher incidence of uh, having these uh, intravascular problems. So, you know, to a certain extent, you will be able to predict it uh, by doing preoperative studies. Uh, for example, in the fibula flap, uh, either doing a Doppler, uh, Doppler study or a CT angio will give you an idea of the course of the vessel and the luminal diameter and the, or if there's any other narrowing within the vessel. But most of the time, it's usually uh, overt only when we are operating. It becomes obvious only when we are operating. So the problem with atherosclerosis is that uh, the vessel lumen is narrowed because of the plaque. The problem with an intimal dissection is that there is a false lumen created within the vessel and the blood tends to flow there and then eventually cause uh, you know, thrombosis of the vessel. And in cases where the walls are very calcified, it is difficult to drive the microvascular suture through. So the solution for the atherosclerosis as well as the intimal dissection is that do not handle the vessel unless absolutely necessary. And at no point should you do any maneuver that dislodges the plaque 
within the vessel lumen. Always use sharp scissors to make the cuts in the, at the end of the artery because any serrated cut or any grinding cuts will cause the plaque to separate or will cause the internal dissection to become worse. And you should remember that the atherosclerosis uh, or, or the plaques need not be a continuous phenomenon. The vessel will be beady and thick at different points along its course. So all you need is to do need to do is to cut back till you get a healthy lumen to pass the suture. You do minimal adventitial preparation again, not to manipulate the vessel too much. Uh, you have to place the clamp gently on the vessel because any you know rough placement of the clamps can dislodge the plaques. And use uh, or try doing clampless anastomosis, for example, doing the back wall in from outside to in to inside to out. Uh, if you're looking, looking at a vessel which has got a plaque inside it, you always have to follow the inside out technique so that when you take the needle and drive it from the lumen through the vessel wall, the plaque is plastered to the vessel wall and does not dislodge. So you have to be adept at you know, passing the suture in the reverse direction, or you have to be adept in doing a you know, back wall, front wall sort of anastomosis. And if the vessel wall is heavily calcified and thick, uh, you can use a 7-0 Sergipro micro suture because the needle is very strong and it tends to pass through a calcific vessel much easily. So veins generally do not suffer from vascular pathology. The most commonly encountered anatomical problem is that there are valves. And these valves are usually seen in the bullous parts of the veins where the vein has a slight bulge, a bluish bulge, you know that the valves are there. The valves are there for a reason to prevent reverse flow of blood. Uh, but we have to be careful when we're suturing an area that there is a valve. You can always cut back to an area where the, the vein lumen is clear. So you should avoid picking up the valve during your suture if that is possible. Otherwise, take full thickness bites, including the valve and plaster it to the vessel lumen, uh, to the vessel wall, so that it doesn't cause any floating fragments within the vein lumen. Now, vessel orientation and ex external compression is a very important uh, uh, point that you have to remember. So because in, in most of the head and neck defects, the pedicle is tunneled through other soft tissue or in the cases of a fibula flap or any other bone flap, it is tunneled under the newly placed bone and hardware. So our principle is always flush the artery with heparinized saline prior to the anastomosis and watch for unobstructed venous return. If there is any resistance in the arterial flush, then there is a torsion of the pedicle or external compression, or there's an accidental lega clip distally. You have to watch out for all of these. And the above steps are crucial before you start doing the micro, because once you've done the micro and you find that the, the flap is not perfusing because of torsion, you cannot correct the torsion unless you take down the anastomosis. So it only adds to the stress and increasing the ischemia time. So the good uh, habit would be to try and flush the artery always with hepsiline. Look for the unobstructed vein flow before uh, embarking on doing the microvascular anastomosis. And vessel orientation is in, it should be done in such a way that there is no tension to the anastomotic site. A gentle curve of the pedicle is preferred if there is excess of length of the pedicle. And sometimes you may need to suture the pedicle to the soft tissues of the neck to keep it in place. So um, these are some of the things that you can try and do uh, to avoid kinking or unnecessary, you know, turns of the vascular pedicle. So what happens if you have an non-functional anastomosis. So you've done the milking test uh, distal to the anastomosis and you don't find the uh, arterial flow into the flap or the flap shows no bleeding or is congested. You have to roll out the following uh, problems. Either there, uh, whether there's a compression or not on the vascular pedicle, you have to make sure that the patient is not uh, in hypotension. Sometimes inotropic supports will cause vasospasm of the perforators and the distal pedicle and may mimic that the flap is not getting perfused or the vessel can be in prolonged vessel spasm, which can be corrected by uh, papaverin or topical lidocaine or uh, keeping warm saline sponges. So you have to rule out all of these things before you take down the vascular uh, anastomosis. And in more often than not, uh, it's usually the hypotension or the compression that is the problem. So you have to pay particular attention to the course of the pedicle and the tunnel and always keep checking with the anesthetist whether the patient is maintaining normal BP or not. So what are the problems within the arterial anastomosis? So when you look at a, a non-functional arterial anastomosis, there are three problems that you will encounter. 
One is that the anastomosis doesn't work and you have a sticky platelet plug inside, or you can have partially organized thrombus, or you can have a fully organized thrombus. A sticky platelet plug is, you know, you'll find fine specks of reddish colored uh, platelet plugs in and around the vessel lumen. They're quite easy to dislodge by a rapid uh, saline flush, or you can remove them with your jeweler's forceps. Uh, a partially organized thrombus also can be removed with the jeweler's forceps by forceful uh, saline irrigation. But the fully organized thrombus is quite uh, tricky because if we try to do an aggressive thrombectomy, uh, we might damage the intimal uh, layer of the vessel. So what do you do in such a situation is that you cut back either on the neck vessel or on the pedicle uh, uh, artery, uh, and then you find a, a suitable lumen where there is not, where the thrombus hasn't extended to, and then use that part of the of the um, uh, flap artery. And in the neck, you can always look for a second vessel. I always, uh, you know, in, uh, when I plan to do an arterial anastomosis, I always expose the superior thyroid as well, so that if there is a problem with the facial, I always have a second vessel that I can do the anastomosis to. So you have to be very careful in doing an aggressive thrombectomy uh, because that will uh, can damage the intimal layer of the uh, vessel. And then try and redo the anastomosis with a finer microsuture. And you can always consider heparin infusion in these patients. You can give 5,000 units of heparin IV, or you can give an heparin infusion in 500 ml of uh, saline over eight hours. And this will keep the you know, microthrombi from forming once you've redone the anastomosis. So the vein thrombosis is usually due to a kink in the vein position, uh, or it can be due to a distally ligated vein in the next side. And this is common uh, when you use the EJV, especially and the level five neck dissection has been done. Uh, the EJV may be damaged as it courses behind the uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle and there might be a clip or it might be tied. So what I do is for all veins that I do, I flush the vein uh, in the neck aspect to see whether the saline is leaking from any wound in the neck or any corner in the neck, or if the saline is flowing un without any impediment. So always try to flush the vein before you're doing the vein anastomosis. Uh, the same principles as in arterial thrombosis, but before you take down the vein, make sure that there is blood flowing into the flap as well. So always check the artery before checking the vein. What are the immediate post-op problems? The commonest problems are anastomotic failures and hematoma. Hematomas can be diagnosed by the skin being, you know, uh, the, the neck being enlarged or a collection under the neck, a fluctuant collection under the neck. If it's an organized thrombus, there is erythema of the skin um, around the suture site. And basically any change in the contour of the neck in the immediate post-op, you should suspect that there is a hematoma and you should proceed to evacuate it even if it means it's being done on the bedside. So the other common problem is the uh, you know, problems with the anastomosis. Now we have to break the uh, anastomotic problems into two time frames. One is uh, problems which are there from the first to the third day. And the second anastomosis failures are the ones which are beyond the third or fourth day after the surgery has been done. Usually the first to three day problems are not infective and they can generally be redone because the tissue planes are not contaminated by saliva or muck. Whereas usually if it's beyond three or four days, uh, you always suspect infection or a salivary leak. And this is harder to correct uh, uh, compared to a one to three day anastomosis failure. So you do a surgical re-exploration, obviously. Uh, the same principles as that of the intraop uh, failures of uh, microanastomosis. So you do the same thrombectomy, you do the cutbacks, you redo the anastomosis to alternate vessels, or you try to find a vein graft for a distally placed neck vessel. Uh, you always check the artery and vein both. Don't ever check only one vessel because the flap was either delayed or the flap was congested. You have to, once you're in the neck for a re-exploration, you always check both the artery and vein. And the critical time for re-exploration is less than two hours. Because the longer you wait, the chances are that the thrombus is going to organize and you're going to have difficulty in doing a thrombectomy. And always try to find the cause of the thrombus uh, because usually if it's an anastomotic technique, for example, if you've picked up the back wall or you've included the intima of the back wall in your stitch, or if there is some free floating debris in the vessel, it usually manifests very easily on table itself. By the time you close the flap, you'll see that there is a problem. But if you have a problem that has taken two or three days to occur, 
look for you know uh, you know places for hematoma look at the vessel pedicle orientation see if the skin is too tight or the the tunnel is not uh, wide enough so you have to look at if possible try to find out the cause for the thrombus so anastomosis failure you correct the systemic identify the anastomosis sometimes it's quite difficult because of all the fibrin plaques that usually form over the neck soft tissue so you have to identify the anastomosis first under the microscope and avoid you know manipulating the anastomosis too much because the tissue can be friable you examine the artery first if the artery shows a thrombus you evacuate the thrombus from the pedicle or if there's a thrombus in the uh, neck source vein you evacuate the thrombus from there or you find another source artery or use a vein graft to reach a distal artery usually it's not the case because we have the external carotid in the neck we have numerous branches that can be sacrificed so usually we don't have to take a vein graft to go to the transverse cervical or any of the arteries in the chest but uh, it's possible if you can expose the external carotid that would be the best way to go and then you redo the anastomosis if there's a vein thrombosis you evacuate the thrombus and you can try and remove the clip from the second venae comitans of the flap all of the flaps have one artery and two veins or most of the flaps have one artery and two veins so you can always try and open the other vein to see if there is flow but in most instances the other vein would have already thrombosed since the uh, time of surgery so it is quite difficult to to use the second vc especially if it's a second or third day re exploration you find another source vein the commonest vein that you can use again is to do a end to side uh, internal jugular anastomosis or you might have to use a vein graft to come to the igv and then you redo the anastomosis but in spite of you know a successful uh, anastomosis meaning the anastomosis technique was good and you're able to see blood flowing into the flap but uh, the flap doesn't uh, push out any blood into the vein now you're in a in a phenomenon called the no flow phenomenon and this low flow phenomenon is actually a very difficult problem because this usually happens if there is prolonged ischemia and a delay in us taking up the case for the surgical re exploration the changes are not in the macro circulation but in the micro circulation and uh, because there is damage to the vascular endothelium uh, in the zone 2 zone 3 levels of uh, the micro circulation even in spite of the artery you know pumping blood into the flap we don't have a venous return so this is a problem which means that the flap is not viable people have tried to use intra arterial streptokinase to try and re, you know break the um, micro thrombi within the micro circulation but it seldom works so if you have come to a point where the artery is you know pumping blood in but you're not seeing any venous return it's probably because the uh, you know the exploration took time or it was a missed uh, failure and these flaps are generally not viable and you have to consider an alternate flap now the delayed thrombosis that is what happens after the third or fourth day of the surgery is secondary to an infection or fistula and they're very difficult to correct because the vessels are very friable the vessels are infective uh, even if you redo an anastomosis or do the a second vessel or a do a vein graft because the bed is infected there's always a chance of anastomosis blow out uh, they are prone for rethrombosis even if you successfully do it and it's a progressive problem you wait till the infection clears and then you plan an alternative flap and you debride all non viable tissue to prevent uh, you know superadded infection because of the dead tissue in the neck or in the oral cavity so these are some of the delayed problems here you can see a patient who has a complete loss of the skin paddle of a fibular flap this is another fibular flap where the patient had partial necrosis of the the fibular skin and this is another patient where the complete flap was lost this was a tdap that i had raised for a buccal mucosa and a palate and he had very tight skin because he had multiple flaps and multiple surgeries we had done the anastomosis to the uh, superficial temporal artery and the flap failed because of external compression on the fourth and fifth day so you can have delayed problems in flap losses and the problem is it's an all or none phenomenon if the skin goes you always have to think about putting another flap inside it can be a secondary free flap or it can be a pedicle flap after that but unless you correct the underlying problem and why this flap failed could be an infection could be a bad inset could be a hardware that was pressing against the vascular pedicle unless you correct the underlying problems your second free flap also is likely to have the same complications the the one 
major issue in putting in hardware and putting in a bone flap is that you have to have adequate viable soft tissue cover for these uh, flaps and for these implants. So the problem is if the flap breaks down and you have an exposed bone, uh, it usually means that the bone will get devitalized in some at some point of time. And exposed bone and hardware needs to be closed immediately with a local flap or another free flap. Otherwise, we're going to lose the bone, the hardware, and the entire purpose of the first surgery. So exposed, bo exposed bone and plate needs to be closed as soon as possible. So how do you avoid distal skin paddle loss? This is the commonest problem that we see when we take uh, ALT flap or we take a large skin paddle based on the, uh, for the fibula flap. You have to respect the angiosome concept of Taylor because all of the vascular territories of the skin are perfused by selected perforators along, you know, through the entire human body. So Taylor in his angiosome concept said that you can take the perforator territory, one perforator territory, and you can take the adjacent perforator territory, but not the perforator territory once removed. That is, you cannot take the skin from the third perforator territory because the choke vessels do not have enough pressure to uh, push the blood to the third territory. So I suggest all of you read uh, Taylor's work. Um, there's a clinics in plastic surgery, which describes the, uh, the um, uh, angiosome concept and its application in reconstruction. So always try to take the tissue from your perforated territory, or at the most you can take the adjacent perforated territory, but not the uh, perforated territory, which is you know at, at uh, once removed. And always inspect the edges of the flap for vascularity. Uh, so at the end of the harvest, before disconnecting the flap from the donor side, for example, in the ALT, you always cut the skin at the distal skin uh, area and to see if the flap is bleeding there or not. If it's not bleeding there, then you discard that portion of the skin flap. Uh, if you're going to take a skin flap, which is very large from the ALT territory, it is better you center the perforator on the flap rather than having it at one edge, which increases the chance of distal necrosis. And always avoid thermal trauma to the dermis when raising the flap, because a large part of the blood supply is in the dermal plexus and the subdermal plexuses. So try to avoid uh, thermal trauma to the dermis, especially if you're raising a suprafascial ALT. Avoid the, uh, no inset should be under tension because any inset under tension is going to cause dehiscence. And because of the undue tension at the wound edges, the distal edge may necrose. And don't overdo closures with a single flap. If your defect is so large that a single flap cannot uh, reliably close the defect, always consider using a second pedicle flap to compensate for the primary free flaps insufficiency. So don't overdo your the size of the flap, nor do you overdo the uh, defect that you're trying to close. So this is Taylor's angiosome concept. So if you take, for example, the ALT flap, so this is the perforator for the ALT flap. Uh, so from this, you can take the, the skin from this vascular territory, and then the genicular artery supply near the, the branch of genicular artery supply the, near the knee. So you can include both of these vascular territories in your ALT flap, but you cannot take skin from the shin or from below the knee joint. So you have to respect the angiosome territory uh, concept because that will help you decide what is the maximum limit of flap that you can harvest. So flap dehiscence is a difficult problem to correct. The reason why I say it's difficult is that the most of the dehiscences are because of a technical problem. Either the flap was too large, was too small, or the flap was sutured under a lot of tension, or the mucosal edges were not vascular or viable enough. Like for example, patients who've had radiation before or patients who have scar tissue like submucous fibrosis or patients who've had multiple surgeries in the past. So it is a difficult problem to correct uh, in certain uh, circumstances. A flap dehiscence can lead to fistula formation. In my book, early resuturing after debridement is essential. Uh, just like how Sandeep sir mentioned that if the edges approximate and the edges are viable, you debride what the non-viable tissue is and then you start suturing it. But if you have a dehiscence which hasn't resulted in a fistula, uh, you can always wait and watch. You can't do pressure dressings like how you do for a pedicle flap because you might compress the vascular pedicle, but you can allow the wound to heal by secondary intention, provided the saliva doesn't start soaking the vascular pedicle or the anastomosis. So always remember the dehiscence put the, puts the anastomosis at risk if the flap has survived for seven or eight or 10 days, 
and then you notice the dehiscence, you can probably wait to, for it to heal by secondary intention. But if you see a dehiscence in the first, second, or third day, I would suggest that you go back and re-suture the, uh, the edges. So the principles of redoing a flap or doing a secondary flap is that uh, you always establish the presence of uh, suitable vessels in the neck. So you can do a neck uh, CT angiography to make sure that the vessels are there. All you need is the external carotid and the IJV. If the patient's IJV has been uh, ligated, you can do a cephalic flip where you dissect the cephalic vein starting from the just above the wrist in the forearm, in the arm, up to the deltopectoral groove. And then you flip it subcutaneously into the neck to act as a receiving vein. Or you can do the anastomosis to the opposite side of the neck. Always inspect the vessels for flow before committing on a free flap harvest. Don't harvest the free flap unless you're happy with the arterial flow from the next side and you're happy with the vein uh, quality. Always inspect the vessels before you commit to raising the free flap. Make sure that the mucosal edges and skin edges are debrided. Very important because uh, if you suture non-viable tissue together, they're not going to heal. And uh, free flap, the harvest technique of the free flap is the same principles as you do for a primary free flap reconstruction. Another overlooked problem is the donor site morbidity. So if you look at the three flaps that we use, the ALT, the fibula, and the radial forearm, a skin graft loss is the, a common problem. The second problem is dehiscence, especially if the wound has been sutured very tightly. Compartment syndrome is rare because uh, we usually cut all the, it's a basically raising a radial forearm and a fibula is like doing a fasciotomy. So most of the vascular compartments are exposed and without pressure inside. And there can be loss of sensation, stiffness of the extremities. So the loss of sensation comes with part of the, the morbidity of the flap because the skin territory will be numb. Uh, but in the cases of the radial forearm flap, always try to uh, preserve the cutaneous nerves and I'll talk to you about that. So these are some of the problems with skin graft take and loss of the skin graft. So the reasons why skin graft take is not uh, uh, good or is not complete is that the bed wasn't prepared well enough. So you should always avoid hematomas, make sure that the bed does not have any bleeding, uh, any devitalized tissue in the bed has to be removed and the skin graft has to be tacked uh, to the floor of the defect and should be securely sutured by quilting stitches and using an overdressing. The systemic causes are patients who have diabetes, patients who have hypertension. Uh, these patients also have poor wound healing of the graft site. So you debride the wound and the devitalized tendon and muscle. Usually it's the brachioradialis in the radial forearm or it's the peroneus in the fibula. Uh, use vacuum assisted closures like vac devices to reduce the wound size and then redo the skin graft and make sure this time you avoid all the problems or all the pitfalls that is associated with the skin graft placement and fix it firmly to the bed of the wound. Sensory loss is common if you damage the superficial radial nerve during radial forearm flap. They have an anesthesia over the anatomical snuff box. Uh, you have to try and preserve all the branches of the superficial radial nerve. During a fibula flap harvest, the sural nerve and the superficial peroneal nerves are at risk. They must be preserved at all costs especially if the patient is diabetic or they might have problems with foot and heel sensations later on. The lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh is not very easy to preserve because sometimes the skin paddle may belong to the territory supplied by the lateral cutaneous nerve. But in a small ALT, this has to be preserved as well. Compartment syndrome, as I mentioned, is, is rare. You avoid tight closures and you always watch out for cold extremities, no SpO2 on the pulse ox, pain, pins and needle sensation or skin blistering because all of these are signs that the patient is having an impending compartment syndrome. So to conclude, the proper flap choice and anastomosis technique is key for the success of uh, any free flap surgery. You have to design the free flap to capture the best vascularity and don't overdo the, the length and breadth of the flap that uh, you are raising. Uh, anticipation of anastomotic complications is essential, especially if you have bad vessels in the flap or in the neck. Redo the anastomosis as soon as possible, uh, as soon as the problem is detected, because if you wait too long, either the thrombus becomes completely organized or the patient will have no flow, no reflow phenomenon. You protect the anastomosis from leaks by suturing any dehiscences early and preserve your pedicle flaps as a lifeboat in case your free flap uh, failure occurs.
so thank you for your time and uh, any questions i'll be happy to take them uh thank you very much uh, deepak sir for your uh, truly crisp uh, and uh, uh, practical uh, session uh, so uh, now we'll take up some questions uh, so there is a question uh, from the uh, audience the first question is is uh, low molecular weight heparin helpful and also sir if you can discuss the protocol anticoagulation protocol at your center so uh, in most centers and in most studies they have found that uh, you really don't have to heparinize the patient after routine microvascular anastomosis in in fact the the uh, the heparin that we give clexane and amrita is only for the dvt prophylaxis we only give 0.2 cc subcut once a day so we never give heparin we never give a higher dose of uh, clexane so basically you just give enough to prevent deep vein thrombosis and that's it it is nothing to do with the the uh, the anastomosis and i would start systemic heparin if there was a problem on table with thrombosis and you don't want microthrombi to form and that's also the, it's not based on very solid evidence or anything is just a routine practice that we have here so uh, i wouldn't do that uh, routinely for patients except that they receive low, um, clexane 0.2 cc for dvt prophylaxis and i think there's a question on low weight uh, low molecular weight dextran yes. so we stopped using dextran uh, a long time ago because dextran has been associated with uh, uh, having increased uh, lung complications patients who received dextran they found in many studies including the amrita study that their chances of lung complications were higher and it did not add to any improved survival of free flap so i think in most centers around the world they stopped using uh, low molecular weight dextran um, for their routine flaps i don't think they use it at all in any of the yes. centers yes uh right so uh, i think uh, we will take up uh, rest of the questions after the panel because many of the questions would be probably answered during the panel yeah that so, is great so yes yes thank you uh, so now uh, we can move on to the uh, panel so uh, for all of us uh, there are certain real life situations that cause a great deal of distress and frankly leave us short of answers as to the management uh for this uh, we welcome uh, dr dushyant mandlik the moderator of the panel uh, dr dushyant uh, mandlik is consultant head and neck reconstructive and robotic surgeon at hcg cancer center amdavad he has keen interest and insight in ablative as well as reconstructive surgeries with notable original contribution in the field he was awarded the uicc fellowship under one of the pioneers of reconstruction dr mark arken Uh, he is fellowship uh, director at the hcg cancer center secretary of fhno institutional fellowship program and member of education committee of golf program of ifnos mskcc and ec committee member of fhno uh, may i please request uh, dushyan sir and also uh, i would like to uh, introduce our esteemed panel uh, who are with us today uh, to be uh, part of uh, the discussion uh the, our uh, first panelist uh, dr prabha yadav madam uh, she is hod of plastic and reconstructive department at sir h n reliance hospital mumbai uh dr uh, subramanya ayya sir hod department of head and neck surgery and plastic and reconstructive surgery aims kochi uh, dr akshay kutpaje uh, consultant head and neck surgical oncologist and reconstructive surgeon at hcg bangalore Uh, Dr. Soumya Matthews, Consultant, Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, TMH, Mumbai. Uh, Dr. Amit Chiram, Consultant, Department of Otolaryngology, AIMS, Delhi. And may I also please request our uh, speakers, Dr. Sandeep Sir and Dr. Deepak Sir, to be available uh, for the panel discussion. Uh, over to you, uh, Dushyant Sir. Good evening, everybody, and uh, uh, it is so good to see a large crowd to have this niche. conversation on reconstruction and complications of reconstruction in head and neck uh, it is really heartening to see the interest i think you are able to see my screen yes yes sir please yeah. go so this is the fifth session in the series of six sessions this is today we are going to talk about reconstructive surgeries complication and management we had excellent talks by uh, dr sandeep and dr deepak who has covered almost all the aspects of 
complications in free flaps as well as in the local flaps and had an excellent uh, presentation. We would like to cover certain scenarios uh, during our this, uh, reconstructive stress and surgeries. We all, uh, you know, love Hagar, the horrible. He is such a positive person, you know, he always throws a smile whenever there are certain complications or certain problems. And he is very well known for his appetite also. But even Hagar has sometimes problems and he asked God, why me? And then God says that, why not you? You know, you are not something. And this happens to all of us, you know, everything is going fine. All the flaps are turning good. And suddenly you have a series of one, two, three, four complications. And you are kind of questioning, why me? When I was actually preparing this presentation, I went through this very well-known book of Way and Mardani. And I was reading this Avoiding Complication chapter by Jeremy, Andrew and Vine. And it is actually reflecting what all of us thinks. It says that it is something of a dance to personal pride to be singled out among so many internationally distinguished contributors to write a chapter on complications in microsurgery. How did editors know we were so experienced? Maybe our panelists and our lecturers must be thinking same. You know, we would like to be able to make the same boss as an esteemed surgical mentor who were asked to speak on complication, warm to the subject by stating that I am an authority on complications. I saw one once. Sadly, good judgment comes from the experience and experience comes from the bad judgment. And we at least qualify from the experience side of the equation. So whenever there are complications uh, and when we deal with the complication, what they leave to us? The complications will leave two holes instead of one. Like we take a flap, we take another flap and there are two ends. Telltale limb scars of wing grafts, salvage trays of desperate surgeons and hematomas, Introductory from inquiry of relatives, the shattered confidence and bitter disappointment of the patient. And for us, we always kind of have self-doubt, what more could I have done to make this work? Was it a bad tissue, assistant, the anesthetist, our favorite one, the nurse monitoring, or just a good surgeon out of luck? And why am I doing this microsurgery? Do I need this? How did I get into this mess? Who can I share it with? And last but not the least, where is caustic soda and which way was the river? Uh, Dushan, sir, uh, just, uh, just uh, before you continue, uh, one more panelist I would like to introduce is our own very own Dr. Danusha Gohil. He is a consultant and plastic reconstructive surgeon at HCG Ahmedabad. He is also going to be uh, part of our panel. Danushya, welcome. And uh, uh, I would like to add that Danushya is a kind of a, uh, Robert, I mean, Robert Schauder. Uh, he is doing uh, 350 plus free flaps, and we are happy to have him. Uh, so uh, we will like this panel to be uh, very uh, kind of conclusive, good point and sharp with take home messages. For every case, uh, we would like to have the discussion on what is this complication, how we could have avoided it, and what can be the corrective action, and any other uh, innovative inputs you have. Uh, as we all know, we want to identify if there is a failure in planning and execution or failure in the post-operative care about the patients. So uh, we will start with our bread and butter day-to-day -day challenge. That is vascular compromises in free flap. Deepak has very elegantly covered everything almost in uh, free flaps. Uh, but I will still like certain cases to be discussed by our esteemed panelists. And uh, I will introduce you with uh, three case scenarios which I have with me. Uh, in case one, it is POD4, and I have reconstructed the tongue with a free radial forearm flap. As you can see, that part of the flap is congested, part of the flap is good. In uh, scenario two, uh, in a hammy tongue, uh, we have reconstructed it with an LT flap. It is day five and flap has started giving congestion at the edges of the flap. 
in part three, there is a binom AMP for a full thickness defect, and this is day eight of the flap. Flap is swollen, flap is edematous, but uh, still it is bleeding good. Uh, I would like Akshay uh, to comment uh, on uh, these three scenarios, and I would like uh, 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 him to tell that how he is going to manage this flap, or what, what he will do with this flaps. Akshay. Yeah, thanks, thanks Dushan. Uh, in the scenario of the flap one, I would, uh, since there's just a, a edge, uh, the flap edge is slight, slightly discolored and rest of the flap is bleeding well, I wouldn't be uh, much worried about that uh, flap unless my drains are not working and if I'm suspecting uh, early uh, or uh, the fistula uh, connecting to the uh, neck. The second scenario in which uh, the flap looks dusky uh, and uh, uh, in this situation, uh, I would uh, consider uh, consider exploration. And this is a situation, it's day uh, post-op day four or five. Uh, there is, so there is a chance that the patient has developed a, a fistula to the neck and uh, we need to go and clean up the neck and uh, uh, see check the anastomosis as well. On the third scenario, the flap looks, uh, it's just a, a, it's a flap is swollen. Uh, if, the, if I examine the neck, there is no collection in the neck or any obvious, uh, uh, obvious signs of any hematoma, I would still wait and watch in the class three, class three and class, uh, the case one and case three scenario, I will be happy to wait and watch if there is no hematoma and other signs. But class two, uh, definitely I'll take it to theater and uh, uh, give a, open up the neck and have a thorough walk and inspect the osmosis. Sobia, you will like to have uh, any other things? Uh, you will you will like to differ with uh, Akshay in some way, Sobia? Um, in the first two case scenarios, I think I agree with Dr. Akshay with what he said. Um, case three would depend on what I experience intraoperatively with this flap. If there was any issue with the perforators to begin with, um, and things as such, because at times uh, waiting on some uh, flap like this would mean that it's wishful thinking at, and uh, it would just mean that it would result in an orocutaneous fistula and make that uh, side of the neck, uh, you know, contaminated, which may preclude my further reconstruction that it would require. So what you will do? You are muted, Somia. In case the skin flap, hello? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In, in case there is like skin peeling from that flap in case scenario three, uh, I would possibly take down that flap without waiting any further. Only so because uh, if there is an orocutaneous fistula that may develop in this scenario, it might it may preclude my further reconstruction. But scenarios one and two, um, I agree with Dr. Akshay what he said. Dr. Danusha, you will like to uh, add something or? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I uh, In case scenario one and case scenario two, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Akshay. Uh, but in case three, uh, I would like to do some comments. As uh, uh, Dr. Soumya uh, told that, uh, uh, already told that there is a, some, uh, int uh, we, we could find out some uh, intraoperative, uh, some uh, another picture. But uh, one point I agree with Dr. Akshay that the flap is swollen. So I would like to do a, a removal of suture surrounding areas. So that might be helpful. And then uh, it gives the blood supply to the, what actually will be seen in this scenario surrounding uh, stitch line. So I think uh, I would go for the first open the stitches and then want to wait. Okay, so for I think, for first, you will wait. For second, you will go in and open. And for three, for third, you will uh, release the outer pedal. Amit, you have something else to uh, add to it? Or you agree? No, uh, I would like to know the intraoperative, what are the, I means how was the designing of the flap? And uh, for the case one, whether I means the venous is, the congestion on the peripheral part is mainly, it looks like a venous. So whether you have taken the uh, deeper venous system or the superficial venous system or both anastomosis. If you have taken both. Yeah. 
So it's a single anastomosis or a double anastomosis of the vein. You have done two anastomoses, one with uh, superficial and one with deep system. So this one, I would like to wait because okay. even if the most of the time the lab is either all or non phenomenon, but this seems to be only a, it just seems to be a bit congested. Amit, can you tell me that why this happened to a part of the flap and why other part is okay? Can can there be anything anything which is which is making it discolored only in part and uh, the other part is fine? The planning of the flap, whether it means where you have taken the the congested part, whether it has got the proper venous drainage or not, that is also important. Okay. And the, the case number three, the the condition of the uh, supply of the, you must have taken a bipedal one in this, both for the inner and the outer lining. The outer lining and the inner lining, the condition is a bit different. The perforator you have used for the inner, that must might have gone some problem with that. Okay. Can I add something? Yes, Deepak, please. So in case one, I think it's probably because of the acute turn of the cradle forearm, where it's going from the tongue to the floor of mouth. So that could explain why there is minimal venous congestion there. Exactly. That was the case. Two sutures were actually making a crease. Yeah. So if, if there's an acute bend in the flap, usually the only the distal radial forearm has the actual septum attached because as you go more proximally, it's a free, free pedicle there. So this is probably the dermal supply, which has got some impediment, the dermal return. That's how the this part of the flap is getting perfused. So that could explain that. And I 100% agree with Samia on the case number three. The inside part is not going to work. And you have to go in early and debride that and put another pec major or something else. But there's a, there's a fact to this designing. Always, my principle has been, take the most robust part of the flap intraorally. Because you have to seal off any oro neck fistula. So wherever the perforator is, the, per, the skin closer to the perforator, this is a large ALT, the skin closer to the perforator, you take it intraorally because you know its vascularity will not be bad. And then use the distal skin to cover outside because an external skin defect is easier to reconstruct with a pec pager rather than a, or a DP or a supraclavicular rather than the intraoral defect. So I would design the flap in such a way and use part of the flap which was closer to the perforator for the intraoral inset and suturing. And then the external uh, part can be the distal part of the flap. That's how I always plan the ALT because I don't want the distal part of the flap to go inside where the vascularity can be compromised, especially with aggressive deapitalization. So that's how I would design the ALT for bipedal uh, defects. That's a great point, Deepak. I think that you you want your most robust part of the flap to be intraoral. So at least that part survives and you can actually cover it uh, uh, with another flap if required from the outer side. At least you will be having a partial flap, half of yes. the flap with you, which is the most needed uh, yes. kind of part. This of the place for ALT, pec major, any flap where yeah. the most robust and vascular part of the flap should go intraorally. Right. Uh, so, Dr. Sandeep, you would like to add something? Uh, well, I would suggest that all the three cases need some action. First one needs uh, to look at the tight sutures take out the kink that is there and also do some scratching on the part which is congested so as yeah. to do a phenomena. I would say multiple I, incisions with a needle or like 11 number blade and then uh, take a on that. So that at least you have taken care of the initial condition and so it doesn't spread further. Second and third both need exploration. Second may, may not be able to survive and even the third case because it's a longer duration uh, free flap, which is almost the eighth day that these things are happening. There is still a chance that and we may be able to do something. I would not be totally agreeing that this is this is hundred percent a failed flap. Because if everything is still happening, say four times or five times a day, you would have caught it within say six to eight hours. Okay. Uh, uh... So I think very good inputs by Dr. Sandeep on all the three flaps. And uh, uh, Dr. Prabha, will you like to add something to all the discussions?
Dr. Prabha? Shibu, can you, can you, uh, will you like to add something else? Prabha, yeah. you need to unmute yourself. Is Prabha coming in? Prabha, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah, you need to and unmute yourself. Yes. Yeah. See, the first case, as uh, Deepaka said, there is an acute fold there. So there is agreement on the first case and the second you need to explore. The second exploration may be looking at it is slightly delayed exploration because already the flap is uh, too dark. This, I mean, explore and maybe you'll have to be prepared for some alternative flap in that case. Case three, I think uh, whether this is a deepithelized flap which is folded or whether it is a chimeric flap, you have to perforate and separate it in future dates. That we don't know. It is deepithelized. So it's deepithelized. Then, like Deepak has said, anytime you're putting in the uh, composite flap for lining and cover, you have to dip your internal lining should be sound because very difficult to go if your lining goes bad because it's easier to put any flap outside so the safest the best part of the flap should go intra orally and then the distal part is deepithelized to come out this could be i don't know how it has happened whether it is inside out or outside in but the inner pattern doesn't look good the outer i am not seeing the whole picture the inner flap is dicey, may result in so waiting for a long time will uh, have an OC which is going down into the neck. So I think you need to explore, see how it is. If the outer skin paddle is with the proximal end of the flap, you may be able to still salvage it, take out the inner part and put something inside. You need to explore because the waiting is not going to really solve because patchy intake inside is always a troublesome thing. It will always end up in an OC and you will have always have a problem and a secondary thrombosis and you lose the whole flap in any case. So you need to explore flap two and you need to see the flap, you need to explore the flap and in case three also. Dr. Aya? Um, agree, for flap one, everybody is uh, quite clear. Flap two, the chances of salvage is remote. Still, I will explore. And as Prabha said, we'll be ready for a plan B also, if needed. Uh, because it's a fourth day congestion like this. Uh, and it would have been there for some time. So your chance of getting it right, even if you're getting it right, it will re thrombose. Flap three is the issue. Here, I would agree to the general uh, thing which uh, uh, Deepak and... Uh, Prabha said about the, you know, the healthier side inside because that is more important. Now here the problem is if you debride it, you are sure to damage the vascularity of the other one. You will kill the other one. If you don't debride it, you have a chance of necrosis. You will have to. But I would, I would personally wait for some more time so that at least you can debride it in a safer way and then cover it. Even if you debride it today. There will be a defect and the outer paddle also might go because of your, your whole process of debridement and putting something there. Putting something there with a paddle like this outside is going to be extremely difficult. So my bet would be I would have waited for some more time thinking that ultimately I will have a plan B of if everything goes, I will have to do something. Uh, do you agree with uh, Danush's uh, comment that he will remove sutures and decompress the flap. Yes, I would. I, I yes. would. I would. But I would. I would uh, remove the sutures on the top part so that yes, the chances of fluid seeping in is also less. But again, then you have to look at it. Where is it deepithelized? I am sure the deepithelization de would be in the cheek, cheek. You know that uh, labial side rather yes. than anywhere. Yes. So uh, deepithelization there doesn't help too much still still i would do it in that entire upper half okay uh, any of you uh, when while waiting and watching and not exploring the neck in case, case scenario one and three you will like other investigation like doppler anything to substantiate your uh, waiting period or to support or just clinical clinical mainly clinical Anybody will uh, agree or disagree or any anything else? 
if so, you if you were monitoring the alt the larger alt the case 3 with a doppler which you had you have actually marked there and the perpetrator is still working then the point is that we have to see if there is an hematoma only that is causing this problem or it is the whole flap which is having a problem from its root so if we have that thing confirmed by the previous monitoring the way we have been doing it then definitely there is a case to see if there is an hematoma there but if that has not been done, and this is something which we are only monitoring by doing the scratch test, then I would say the issue would be that this flap is failing more on the inside and less on the outside. And it's based on the same perforator, but ultimately it is coming from the same root. So something has to be there, whether there is a thrombosis over there or a pressure in the neck, one has to rule that out. Because the only chance we have for saving this flap would be to do an exploration, if we have a chance. So just a point on the inner side before like I would give a thorough cleaning of the oral cavity and then I would do a pinprick test and if the pinprick test still is bleeding bright, uh, I think it is a more reason to wait and watch but if there is any collection definitely the, the, uh, the sutures have to be opened and uh, uh, opened up, so sutures have to be opened up. Right, so uh, same thing uh, was done here and uh, we actually released some sutures in case A and uh, we allowed the flap to breathe a bit, uh, relax a bit and the color definitely changed. Uh, no doubt flap two, we, have to, we had to take inside. There was an extensive thrombosis and edema inside the flap. We had to debride it and we, have, uh, we had to do another flap. In case three, we removed the stitches of the outer side. We applied saline dressing to that and uh, we waited and slowly the inner part also slowly regained the vascularity though the epidermis peeled off the dermis remained there and uh, after around a week or 10 days uh, we uh, had both inner and outer pedal which were good in vascularity but the outer pedal uh, required a bit of one week or more to be researched uh, because uh, we uh, had to allow it to drain the edema, but we were able to salvage the flap three also with uh, conservative management. Uh, mm. One thing we added to it, uh, which we do here in our institute, and uh, we are kind of right now monitoring our data also for that, is that for flap one and flap three, we did a color Doppler of neck vessels. And uh, uh, we found that uh, my radiologist was able to trace the vessels up to the flap and he was even able to do that intraoral Doppler of flap one and uh, flap one also. And he was confident that there was a biphasic flow in the artery and the vein was also draining, uh, which gave us more hard to rate for even flap three and flap one. Uh, though uh, we don't have data at right now which are mature, but this is something else which we have added to our armamentarium in that. I would like your comments. So that means the reason for the third flap to have this uh, complication was the uh, acute turn that happened between the two paddles which were more robust than actually would have warranted. Right. And so that congestion was basically within the flap itself, not into the, its circulation. Not into itself. the circulation, exactly. That flap could have been left little. I would say, don't complete the inset at that point of time when you're doing the initial inset. Was so it was an that is excellent point you actually made in your presentation that if you feel that your external uh, inset is going to actually compress the flap, don't do the external inset, uh, delay it a bit. I think that's a very good point uh, which you mentioned in your presentation. So, uh, uh, again, the same book. Uh, Bay and Madini, they enumerated the causes of flap failures. They are reversible causes and irreversible causes. So we have to uh, brainstorm that uh, what is the problem with the flap failure, you know? And if there are reversible causes, is, are we able to actually address those causes and uh, go ahead and do something about that? At the same time, uh, they have uh, mentioned a very good points when you are going for re-exploration. You know, whenever uh, we do some flap and whenever there is a problem, uh, the knee-jerk reaction of many of the reconstructive surgeon is to go inside and explore. 
but we don't know what to do. You know, we don't have an algorithm for exploration. We don't have a backup plan. So uh, Wei and Mardini actually mentioned 13 points, not less than 13, not more than 13. And I would like to uh, tell those 13 steps is that first you need to recognize the problem. You need to recognize that there is a problem there and you have to diagnose the problem. You have to see that there are any external effects or not, like compression, dressing, uh, just like in the flat three, it might have been a tight suture. You have to have a definite decision for imperative surgical intervention. You have to have your entire team in. You have to inform the patient and the family of the problem and the need of surgical intervention. We all know that when you explain the patient, the patient is going for the big care for any reconstructive surgeries. It is very important to tell the patient that there are chances that there may be a re-exploration. You might need a new flap, and you have to counsel the flap patient accordingly. But when the situation comes again, you have to be very careful in explaining to the patient also. And no doubt you have to explain the consent also in an explicit way that you may need a new flap treatment, etc. You have to prepare your open staff also because usually the phase at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in night and no one except you. And you have to actually uh, have the microscope, your instruments, everything there. You have to have a preoperative workup. You may require blood or other products if there is a hematoma or there is a lot of bleeding. You have to have expedient transport and preparation of the patient. As Deepak rightly said, that there are golden hours of flap salvage. Beyond that, there will be impossible to salvage the flap. So uh, that is very important. Sometimes what happens that in institutes where there are more than one plastic or reconstructive surgeons, the surgeon who has done the flap uh, knows every bit about the flap, you know, where the perforator is, where the kink might be, uh, by doing what you can actually salvage the flap. So the one who is exploring should communicate with the person who has done the flap, and uh, that can be really, uh, you know, useful. And uh, then comes the operative intervention. So 13th step is the operative intervention, and you have the 12 steps I think if you go through all these steps uh, religiously, your salvage rates will definitely improve. So as we uh, discussed, uh, we were able to salvage two flaps. Now, uh, the next case, which we are going to discuss is of a 65-year-old female patient where we did a wide excision of buccal mucosa and a marginal mandibulectomy and neck dissection. And uh, the defect was reconstructed with an ALT flap. And then uh, the patient was doing good, great. But then at eight post of day, this event happened. There was a sudden edema uh, of the flap and as well as the cheek skin also. And as you can see that uh, there was a kind of uh, skin changes in the outer skin also. Uh, if you see the flap is still pink inside, but it is edematous. Whenever you are scratching on the flap, there is an oozing of edema coming out of the flap and the fresh blood is also coming out. So uh, my question uh, to again Akshay, Akshay, how you will manage this patient? She is an old lady, eighth post of day, you have a dicey flap in your hand and uh, uh, what you will do and uh, how? Uh, what is the problem and how you will rectify it? So in the pinprick, it was bleeding bright, but with the amount of a little serous fluid. Yeah. And there was no signs of infection. The skin was, uh, there was no rise of temperature. So in this scenario, I would get an ultrasound of the neck. Okay. I would not ha hurry up to take the patient to the operating theater. So I would get an ultrasound of the neck. I would check the hemoglobin. Uh, uh, and then if there is no hematoma, uh, uh, if there is a, a seroma or a hematoma, I would definitely uh, take the patient to the theater and open up and drain the hematoma. I would, wouldn't touch the anastomosis. I would just uh, uh, drain the hematoma and then wait and watch. Okay, so uh, we did ultrasound of the flap. Uh, there was no hematoma. There was hardly 10 cc collection in the neck and little to the flap. But our sonologist said that there is a lot of edema inside the flap. Uh, Soumya, uh, what you will do if there is a lot of edema in the flap, no hematoma, 
and still there is an puffy kind of a plant. Um, it's still breeding. It would, uh, it, I would suggest close monitoring of the flap to be resumed again, uh, to you know check consecutive like half hourly or then if it's okay then you keep increasing the time period and you just to notice whether the change in color of the bleed rather than the bleed itself. So if it looks like it's getting progressively congested, then uh, you know do something about opening up the neck. And releasing whatever uh, collection there is, and um, with regards to ultrasound, uh, this is something that Prabha Madam would usually say that when we send our patients to the ultrasound uh, facility, uh, the pressure with which they would actually do the uh, test, you know, may at times com uh, compromise your anastomosis with the friction rather than the pressure. So yeah, I would. Uh, like to see what is happening rather than rely on an investigation. Okay. With yeah, close monitoring. So a very good point you have said that the, the sonologists, you know, the sonologists are usually trained to compress their frog and uh, to damage your vessels uh, more than what is actually necessary. But at the same time, I would like to add that you need to teach your sonologists how to behave with your flag. So uh, we make it sure that Every time when my patient goes to sonology, sonography or doctor for the flap, one of the person who was inside the OT, my fellow or myself, goes with the patient and asks the sonologist to look at the place where we are actually having the vessels or where we are actually having the problem. And uh, fortunately, my uh, sonologists are now uh, listening to me. They are kind of trained and uh, uh, they are kind of... Uh, helping us out. I would like to add to this scenario that uh, with ultrasonology, we need a Doppler also of the flap vessels. Interestingly, the flap vessels, that is the artery of the flap was fine. It was pulsating nicely with a biphasic flow. The, uh, it was stressed up to the perforator, generation of the perforator from the cheek. But my sonologist said that you, there is no vein. Vein is collapsed. There is no thrombosis in vein categorically, and the vein is entirely collapsed. That, that's what uh, he added to uh, the thing except the edema. Now in that this case scenario, uh, uh, Deepak, will you uh, like to do anything else? I have absolutely no idea because <laughs> I have never encountered such a specific problem where there's so much of edema within the flap that to an intraoral flap. So the sonologist said that the vein is not flowing, is it? Yes, vein is collapsed. There is no thrombosis in vein, but vein is collapsed. Most probably because of the edema compressing the vein. I, uh, this is an ALT flap, correct? Yes, this is an ALT flap. So the mandible is intact. Sorry? Mandible is intact. We need a marginal. So where is the perforator of this flap? That is in the dead center of the flap. So would you think that if you open any anti-gravity sutures, you might uh, release the compression between the cheek and the... Is the bulk of the cheek because of the flap or is it because of the edema? No, it was initially not because of the flap, but uh, it, it was kind of soft and supple. Though it was an ALT, uh, there was a bit of the bulk. The lady was having fat inside the flap. Okay. But it actually increased in last two days. You're sure it's not fat necrosis or anything like that? We are not sure right now. We have not opened it up. I would think that we can try removing some anti-gravity sutures in the oral cavity. Right. Or if you're suspecting this to be lymphedema, I don't know how much manual compression would help because already the vein is collapsed. And by you manipulating or trying some massage or something, it would make it worse. If the vein isn't flowing, I would like to go back into the neck and see what it is because it's ultimately going to cause the flap to die, if that's what you're saying. Okay. So, so, uh, so this is what we did. You know, we opened up the neck. The neck. Yeah. Uh, we opened the entire neck sutures, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, and, and there was a lot of edema fluid that was oozing from the neck. You know, we were getting almost eight to ten pads, kind of. Uh, 
soaking wet with the edema fluid and and we had sure it's it's edema fluid and it's not saliva uh, yeah it was edema fluid only it was okay. edema fluid. Okay. because the neck, uh, because it was so tight you know i, I don't think so anything from intraoral to can get go extraorally because such a tight of the tightness of the flap yeah the tightness of the flap was till date uh, uh, fine all the suture line was good but there was a lot of edema which was coming out and we uh, placed this corrugated drain there uh, lateral to the flap because there was no other place where we could have uh, the addition what was done for the parotid duct for the parotid duct yeah parotid yeah. duct was tied in this case you have ligated the duct yeah ligated the duct sometimes they can be leaked from the parotid tail area also but yes that can be leak i think that's a good point Vishen, you remember the case we did the fibula from axilla where yeah the severe parotitis yeah that that compressed the vein that compressed the vein and i had done it to superficial temporal artery and vein and then uh, you had to redo it with a vein graft for the neck you remember that case yes i do remember it so i guess we have to keep parotid pathology also in mind when you see such like uh, you know that also has to be kept in mind to rule out any salivary collection or uh, parotitis but right. i would have opened the neck in this case purely because the vein wasn't showing any return exactly it blocked at the upper extremity that's why it was not distally filling up so the compression there are higher up the compression was in entire cheek flap so entire cheek was kind of compressing it there was medially uh, medially there was mandible laterally there was tight skin yes so it was kind of in compartment syndrome uh, yes. laterally to the flap it was artery was not as yet compressed because the pressure may not be adequate for that yes yes so it was kind of timely that we uh, released it and uh, when we released it uh, things improved yes. uh, and uh, slowly down the line uh, that also improved as you can see it is can i ask can i ask you a question yeah 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 pedicle was tunnel medial to the mandible or lateral to the mandible lateral to the mandible lateral to the mandible yes it was lateral to the mandible So there was not much of a floor of mouth defect. Yes, exactly. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, what happens, Deepak? Usually, is that when the uh, flap is bulky, and when you are going to put it intraorally, what happens that your uh, suture line to the floor mouth and upper alveolus is there, and then after after two or three centimeters of thickness, your pedicle starts. So if you take the pedicle medially on the mandible, there will be a kink. Correct, correct. So the normal line is usually lateral to the mandible. Yeah, and with ALT thickness, so it will have its own padding like that. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, uh, try and thin the ALT as much as possible. I guess that is the because a lot of this fat is a lot of this edema is because of the fat edema rather than the skin edema. So yeah, it's a bulky flap. Right, right. Bulky so I think uh, debulking of the flap can definitely help in such scenarios preoperatively. So flap. Uh, Fashioning before your insert is also very important. So uh, we were able to salvage the flap, but this is what happened at day twenty. The skin of the cheek gave away, and there was kind of an unhealthy flap, unhealthy soft tissue under the skin of the cheek. Everything else was healing fine, and one day there was a perforation in the skin. and now there is a kind of an unhealthy uh, tissue at that uh, portion now the lady is having an immediate requirement of the radiation also we were thinking that if everything is fine we will either suture the neck or we will put an stg in the next skin but now we are getting another problem with the cheek uh, so so any suggestions how we can heal this wound of the cheek faster to start rt or something you're asking me yeah dr subu yeah yes okay, this question i always felt that there is an infective cause is there an impending sepsis or cellulitis cellulitis i would say so sorry apologies cellulitis in that first element if you see the neck wound it was not a clean wound it was yellowish you know it was not it was early sort of thing why did this uh, skin necrosis occur it was the edema would have been the impending uh, cellulitis did you treat it with antibiotics i'm sure you would have treated it yes so 
the release of the skin to decrease the edema along with the antibiotics would have played the trick whereas this skin necrosis would have been the end arthritis at that time when it occurred which has re resulted in this skin necrosis so don't forget cellulitis leading to this and then the treatment is same what you did you will have to release i would have maybe released a bit intraorally also as uh, deepak suggested anti gravity so that the entire thing maybe i would have put my finger under the tunnel and make sure there is nothing collected there before we do this yeah. this is a big problem now is uh, can you show me the picture uh, is there any other picture which uh, shows the entire lateral side of the face uh, not right now but this is only which i have right now now um, it is going deep into the flap is it uh it is around one, around 1 cm defect with a bit of undermining around the skin around 1 to 1.5 cm and it's under the zygoma it's, it's yeah. just under the zygoma yeah this is the zygoma and here there is kind of undermining under the skin and this is the uh, area mm -hmm. which is around a cm deep yeah your next skin will come by closure i am sure you can mobilize and close or put a graph or whatever is that the right. the other one uh the vascularity will be how is the pliability of the uh, preauricular skin not much sir not much it's uh, going to be a problem even if you mobilize a limburg type of flap or whatever is that or the only way i would say is that you can take a your superficial temporal artery was fine no yes it was fine so maybe a superficial temporal facial flap and then fill it and then put a graft on that might might be one option because it is far away it is nothing is going to happen right doctor sir like frickies like, will be too much for it because it, so you mean like pardon? a frickie flap no 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 pedicle flap no i'm saying pedicle flap like the design like a frickie flap no 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 i would uh, put a superior incision into the temporal fossa and then take the entire superior temporal uh, fascia stf 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 and it's then not a skin flap sir no 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 yeah, okay. i'll put it there okay okay but okay. sir do you would like to add something sorry maybe yeah maybe we use a wax dressing yeah why not you don't have time that's the only problem wax will take at least it is 10 days only it is 10 days 3 3 uh, three, three weeks This is yeah, you can try. See, if it is ten days, you can try. See, you wouldn't like to operate. Hmm. Your uh, only idea is to look at the uh, at the radiation. See, even if you have to do another flap, the edges are still not good enough to receive that flap. That flap itself can get infected. So yeah. why not limit it to by that by doing something only in the local area? And as such, we are doing a grafting at the lower edge. once we have seen that the tension is relieved that yeah, area see is i i see there is no contraindication to whack in this to try initially there is no problem because it's away from the pedicle there is no vascular issues there so you can very well try whack for a week and see how it behaves right and then get it filled sir uh, can i ask some questions sir yes sir Yes, uh, sir. Uh, I want to ask to uh, Prabhaya, the madam, and uh, uh, Subraman Maya, sir. Uh, sir, Dushan sir already told that uh, this uh, wound around uh, around two centimeter. Can we uh, close it primarily as uh, because we, uh, we can see the uh, over the cheek there is a little bit uh, skin is there. No? You you are most welcome to do it with this mobile. <laughs> you know, you know, nobody would put the skin there. If the skin is pliable, you can close that yeah, like yeah. an elliptical excision. But this skin is not yet settled down. No, it must be very indurated. To mobilize that, you may invite little more problems. Okay. So maybe it is just tenth day, so you can debride and wait and wear wax and then take a call because your radiation has to start after six weeks. and after about 8 10 days it doesn't improve then we'll have an option of shifting something local and then putting a graft of shifting an island is small flat from there which you can close primarily all grafted right super special temporal based small flat right. thank you ma'am uh so uh this is the third case uh, hey, what did you do for that <laughs> this is the current situation sir oh is it <laughs> <laughs> You've been clever. You've been clever. 
See, it's only 10th day, so you have enough time. So by that time, I think maybe what uh, Danusha so said, that will work. <laughs> That's why Danusha was very itchy to close it. So I... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next case is of a central arch uh, alveolus patient where we did a uh, central arch segmental mandibulectomy uh, and uh, bilateral neck dissection. And we reconstructed the patient with a um, fibula, prefibula osteocutaneous flap. And uh, he's a 55 year old gentleman, a bulky one. And uh, uh, this is what uh, we got at around fifth day. What happened here is that the patient was doing fine, but suddenly there was an infection at floor mouth. And uh, there was a significant pus discharge from the floor mouth. And that uh, pus discharge actually resulted in a fistula, orocutaneous fistula from the same side where we did neck anastomosis. And, uh, the skin uh, started getting problem. So after, uh, uh, so we, what we did, we opened the neck, we drained the fistula, uh, we placed and corrugated drain inside the neck. Everything was coming out. The wound started getting less and less infected. But as you can see, the skin uh, of the periphery had a bit of vascularity, kind of, but uh, inner inner part of the skin, you know, outer skin was good kind of at the margin, but the inner skin started getting necrosed. This is gone. Uh, so what uh, to do with this flap, you know? Uh, do you go full-fledged inside, debride everything, come out? You just do partial debridement, wait and watch how the flap behaves, uh, because it's a precious flap, a central arch fibula uh, in a hefty man, and uh, till date, the half part of the skin is kind of bleeding well, and we have kind of taken some control of the inflammation and first discharge. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Soumya again. Okay. Um, my first and foremost concern with any free fibula flap in which the skin paddle is giving an issue is um, contamination of the plate. So even if this flap were to survive, if there is a biofilm that gets formed over the hardware, if not now, post-radiation, some time, all that is going to give way and we're going to have, if not immediate, but delayed problems. This flap, the way that it looks, it definitely looks like the inner paddle is gone. A partial inner paddle survival in a free fibula flap is uh, never a good idea. So if uh, the first thing would be to take this patient into the OT, take down the skin paddle, check if the bone is bleeding and if that's fine, give a thorough wash, all that. And if possible, if this, uh, you mentioned that the patient is hefty, so probably taking a thin pliable radial forearm flap and securing the inner lining would be the best case scenario, if that's possible. Right. Unfortunately, we explained same to the patient but patient said that, no, I don't want to go for another surgery. Uh, and uh, we kind of had no choice but to debride the flap uh, inside the ICU. Uh, he was not even ready to go inside the operation theater. And we had to debride the flap. And uh, uh, we, had, we did ser uh, serial debridements of the flap. Uh, and uh, uh, this is what uh, has happened after that, you know. Uh, he has started having granulation from the floor mouth side. Uh, as you can see in the second, uh, there is some skin here, uh, which is also looking good. But as uh, uh, feared, there is a fibula here and there is a partially exposed hardware here in this patient. Uh, so uh, my questions uh, to Dr. Uh, uh, Deepak here is that, uh, how to identify that uh, if the skin goes, it is only the skin loss and uh, not the uh, bone loss, you know? Is it only you go inside the OT and then you know that your bone is viable with all the full-fledged uh, kind of uh, uh, preparation that you have to use a next bone flap or any other investigations or anything else which can say that your bone is viable? How to deal with that scenario? Usually the mm -hmm. skin is a surrogate marker for bone viability. That's okay. how we normally monitor these flaps. 
for when the skin goes the only thing that you can see is rub the bone and see if the bone is bleeding but i doubt that would have been possible in this case after so many days because there will be a lot of fibrin and slough around the bone and for me any any uh, bone exposure means devitalized bone isr also will have some thoughts on this but for me any exposed bone is devitalized bone and any exposed hardware an exposed bone means it's devitalized that is my take on it so you know we have to plan for another bone flap if possible forgetting this person's circumstances uh, but i don't think this will be a viable flap uh, in the long run especially if he's going to receive radiation and all those things this is going to show problems uh, sooner rather than later yeah so he is already having this on the 21st day uh, he is t4 an 0 we will definitely require radiation but with this scenario it will be really dangerous to even uh, send him to the radiation oncologist even yeah but then what are we waiting for because any exposed bone after some time becomes devitalized and exactly. the pedicle behind that bone also was bathed in saliva for some time and bathed with uh, dead tissue and all that so and we don't know if this part of the bone is surviving based on the pedicle attachments or just the periosteal attachments because you know the fibula after a certain point when you do the osteotomies it's only the periosteum that connects the distal most segment and the proximal segment so i i would think that this bone is non viable and uh, you have to plan for something else anything like bone scan or something helps in this scenario yes yes bone scan will help you this 21 days na yeah 21 that days that will show you but you like to really draw the picture and show ask them with the what segment to be seen that will definitely show it not initially for first 5 6 days everything is like an hot spot but now it's almost 3 weeks the yes. bone scan will show whether the bone is viable or not okay so uh, oh, you have to in any case you have to close it so you have to open it and see you will be able to judge that thing also so will, will you like to use any local flaps like bilateral nasolabial or something to cover this central defect dr sanjeev it is possible that if you are pretty sure that the bone is viable and yes. it has been there for almost 3 weeks right maybe there is a good chance that you remove the hardware and just cover it with the nasolabial flap bilateral nasolabial flaps it would be unstable because the fractures are not healed by that time but that would be the only good chance for this patient to have something viable and covered with a vascular tissue which ultimately would heal and would take up some adjuvant therapy because if we leave behind the hardware and do the reconstruction uh, maybe through radiotherapy itself it is going to show exudence of pus and seroma and other things that would be my take on this to come out with as much uh, as little as problems that this patient would have financially and otherwise with respect to time and money okay so you advise to remove hardware and do some corrective surgery kind of local flap or nasolabial or something yeah. uh, amit uh, you uh, want to add something to it most of the points are only discussed uh, but bone scan on the 21 day as ma'am said means but we have been doing bone scan on the means long follow up cases in which um, the skin pedal is surviving and we want to know the viability of the bone so bone scan is an option but hardware exposure i think we need to remove it because that is going to get problem during radiation itself or after radiation any point of time is going to get problem okay so uh, i think uh, we will have to explain the patient about the scenarios because he needs uh, to addition uh, addition can, can i, I, add, I can i sir add something can i add something yes sir yes sir see my, to me the issues are one is the question you ask whether the bone is viable or not there is a chance that it is viable because the skin pedal part is working but if it remains like this it will become unviable uh, the chance that the skin pedal is getting blood supply from the periphery and is bleeding is also there but highly unlike there this uh, in this number of days so if it is viable uh, can i cover it and my priority would be to not to delay the radiation whatever is that and prevent the anti gum deformity to the extent is possible and reconstruct that central mandibular segment later on if possible so if the bone is viable i would like to put a soft tissue covering to that and continue with the radiation 
hoping that it might survive. It might not. But then you have time. You can reconstruct it later after six months or whatever is that. The mandibular arch is maintained then. So you need to replace it with a good vascular tissue. Maintaining the arch is very, very important. I will disagree to what Sandeep said, but I wouldn't even remove the plate. If the bone is unviable, I would retain the plate and put a pectoralis major there and continue with the radiation. And if the patient is reluctant, they are quite, uh, comf you know, whatever is that, leave it for the like that. Let it be exposed. When it is exposed, you correct it, whatever is possible. Otherwise, plan for a, a corrective surgery after six months, one year, but the arch is maintained and your urgency for radiation is over and the, you know that the patient is going to survive or not. So you buy time like that. I would put my you know, bet safely in this way, looking at... Uh, right, sir. I wanted IS sir to say about the plate and PMMC from his mouth. So that's <laughs> no, no, no. See, if you look at if you, if you no, look at right, sir, I, I wanted them to know that. That's all. Because the plate is a piece of it helps the segments in place when we go back and put the uh, the new fibula in also. You don't know what is going to see in six months. Correct. Sir. Whether the patient is alive, patient is uh, this thing. But you are saving that mandibular position for if something can be done at mm. that time. Uh, Dr. Nitin, Dr. Ashay, are there any other questions which we want to take right now? Or we should, or we we should go to the another case. Uh, sir, uh, please continue with the case. Uh, the panelists are answering the questions uh, in the oh, chat box. Great, so great. Continue with the case. Great. Uh, so I think uh, uh, the, this is uh, one of the case which uh, Dr. Sandeep was kind enough to share with us. Uh, it's an 30 year old, uh, 8 year old male patient with no comorbidities, and, and there is a central arch, floor mouth, and neck skin defect and was reconstructed with uh, pre-fibula, multiple forward based skin panels. Uh, uh, he was kind enough to share this uh, images with uh, me also. Uh, as you can rightly see here, there were multiple uh, skin uh, panels here at the tongue, at the floor mouth, at gingival labial sulcus. There was outer skin also, which was involved, which was removed. And I think Sir DA pathologized the uh, skin panel, which was a robust perforated based skin panel and then uh, it was sutured to the outer uh, 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 place. Patient was fine, drains were removed, patient went home, and suddenly the patient comes on uh, day 15th with a swollen flap intraorally, and uh, it's kind of swollen edematous and pale flap, uh, and it is not bleeding even on the scratch. Uh, on the day 15th, you know, it's very delayed kind of thing, uh, so, my question to uh, Dr. Ayer again, uh, how you will take up this situation? It's a free fibula where there is no bleed from the skin. So, it's phased. Uh, I, we don't do the bone scan, but I would buy, uh, I will take the advice from what uh, Prabha and uh, Amit was saying that, uh, you know, I would like to see the viability of the bone. To add to it, uh, the patient was an airline pilot. Yes, uh, if I'm right, Sandeep, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> See, we don't have want, we don't have to worry about such sort of patients. Only Sandeep has to worry. Should be on his twelfth day also. He was okay till day twelve. Not that there was a gap of uh, a week between his uh, visit again. So between. So was the Doppler working? Do you do you think that the flap has totally failed? Yes. On it the skin failed. side, yes. Bone? Was the vessel bone, working? That, that's something which I'll tell you later on. <laughs> <laughs> so I know I would Doppler it if you if you can get a good Doppler or uh, the bone viability by a bone scan is viable. I would assume that the skin paddle is gone. And then you take uh, all the things to cover it uh, uh, quickly. I would say quickly in the sense that, see, it's two weeks anyway. So you can do a second free flap <laughs> with a radial forearm, whatever he said. I would choose a very safe flap, uh, like a radial forearm to remove the entire thing, cover it up, and use the same radial forearm skin for the external cover also. I wouldn't think of any other flap because, you know, to the opposite side, 
radial forearm is the safest in that. I wouldn't look at uh, pectoralis major or anything in this case because of his profession, all those things. Now, it doesn't suit also. So, all depends upon intraoperatively, I find the bone viable or not. If the bone is viable, I'll change the skin paddle to a radial forearm. If the bone is not viable, I would go for a second fibula. Second fibula. Fibula. I think, uh, Sandeep, sir, you can take them uh, ahead of uh, your exploration, I think. Yeah, yeah, actually. Actually, if you take the first uh, photograph, just show the first photograph. Uh, if this is something which you can look at, this dent that we see here. Yeah. So I also had to look it back and then realize that there was something happening which maybe I missed. And this was exactly the place from where the perforator was coming. This is the osteotomy site, is it? And also, yes. And so this was actually the site which his teeth was hitting. Ah. And finally, we lost this flap because everything had settled. He had gone home and he had started oral. Ah. Ah. You don't eat. So, so actually, once he started eating and drinking, yeah. his perforator gave way and everything went uh, haywire. Oh. And to my, I think uh, this is almost the first case that I would have had that I had to take down this flap on the 15th day. Mm. And to my surprise, the artery was still intact. It was bleeding. Mm. And the venous side of the circulation of the flap had nothing. Mm. So as it would have happened, the return from the perforator side was not there because that indentation actually uh, almost killed the perforator there. The bone was bleeding at places. Definitely, it's in the central area, it was bleeding at places, but the periphery still was not. So I took off the whole okay. flap and I did exactly okay. what Dr. Ayer said about the first case, the initial case that uh, Dushan was discussing about. The one case we discussed prior to this. Men retained the plate and gave him a pec major flap because what he required was a huge volume of tissue in the floor of the mouth. It was actually almost a pull through surgery and the flap actually went under the uh, the hardware plate and then came out in the mouth and out over the plate and outside over the neck. So that was how the whole reconstruction was done. Bone was viable. Bone, bone was not viable in the entirety. The, the central segment of the bone did not show any circulation. And that was actually when I was cutting at the flap, I was quite skeptical if this bone was there, then it would have made a case for giving another radial forearm flap or any cover on that. Yeah, yeah. But because of the, the fact that there was an impingement on the circulation of the vessel exactly in the center, it was also causing problem for the distal bone in that very area. So I but, think uh, for mechanical compression. Sir, why you did not do second fibula? Patient did not agree because oh. he needed his legs also. <laughs> he needed to put brakes on his athlete. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For him, he said, if you take a pec major, I can maybe still be fit enough to have some uh, activity. Right. But if you take my both the bones, uh, I may not be fit to be continuing as an airline pilot. pilot. And I have followed this patient. He was an international patient. He was from, uh, I think he was flying uh, Air uh, Romania. Hmm. And uh, this patient, after we did a pec major, he, we, I followed him for almost two years. He did well. Everything is fine. And after that, uh, since last almost uh, eight months or so, I have not seen him. He used to be there coming for regular follow-ups. So let's move again. Uh to the next case. Uh, so I, I did some literature search about the late free fa flap failures in head and neck. And so there are some systemic reviews also. And all of them, as uh, you all have rightly said, there are usually common uh, reasons of failure, like abscess, infection, and vascular compromises, most probably due to uh, some edema or some mechanical uh, compression to the flaps. So in all of the series, almost this has come uh, unanimously as the causes of late FREP failure. 
Now let's go ahead with the uh, one more uh, problem of head and neck. Uh, usually our head and neck wounds are clean or not maximally clean contaminated wound. And we uh, very rarely come again very severe sepsis or very severe necrosis. But I would like to share with you uh, one of the very worst kind of uh, necrosis and infection which we had. He is a patient, 42 year old male, who had uh, through and through defect in the cheek and uh, 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 kind of a lean and thin patient. And we did a, a PMMC flap in him, bilob PMMC flap. The skin of the neck from the day three started giving some discoloration. And at uh, day five, we had this fulminant kind of necrosis in the flap, around the skin area, and even in the chest area. And as you can see, it's kind of a very bad, ugly looking uh, uh, picture. Uh, Dr. Uh, Soumya, uh, what, how you will handle this situation? What you will suspect, what you will do? Looks like some form of cellulitis. What is the status of the intraoral paddle of the flap? Paddle is good. With God's grace, the paddle is good. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, this picture, I mean, it looks worse than what it actually will be. And uh, it could be a wait and watch uh, strategy that can be applied where you uh, give good antibiotic coverage, possibly do some local debridement um, and uh, just give it some time for granulation tissue to reappear and then this uh, chest wound can be managed with just a skin graft at a later date. Dhanushya, would you like to add something? Dr. Dhanushya? Yes, sir. Yeah, you would like to add anything to uh, Sir, yes, sir. By looking this scenario, uh, I, will, I will go through the immediate uh, debridement and remove all the sutures and everything and uh, debris and uh, necrotic tissue and make the wound uh, is clean and uh, mm -hmm. followed by the oral medication and uh, improve the general medical uh, general uh, condition of the patient as uh, uh, over the neck and the flap side uh, same i want to i would like to go to uh, for the debridement and remove all sutures uh, starting from the upper side cranial side uh, uh, gradually to uh, go to down and uh, remove all necrotic tissue and then uh, thorough debridement uh, actually required for this patient. Then only uh, when infective foci is there anywhere in the, inside the body, they definitely will uh, uh, fulminate uh, again and then uh, which, uh, maybe lead to the cellulitis, uh, sorry, um, uh, sepsis and uh, sepsis type of condition. So this is first step to my, to do my, by this. this. So as you uh, you both rightly say that this is not one of the common scenarios in head and neck. Dushan? Yes, yes, Deepak. Yeah, please. Why is the chest wound necrosing beyond the suture line? Is it some sort of fasciitis or yes, sort of necrosing fasciitis? Necrosing the fasciitis. Yes. Because diabetic the, status. Yeah, his general like diabetes and he has no other comorbidities. He is fit and fine. This is so rare, no? Because very rare, very rare. Yeah, Not very even rare. with the oral cavity. What is the reason? Was it a, you know, a resistant bacteria or a MRSA sort of type? MR, so, maybe so, MRSA. Yeah. So, uh, so let me take, uh, take you to through it. Uh, so I, I uh, we did some literature search, and uh, uh, there are few cases of necrotizing fasciitis mm -hmm. in literature, and they do behave bad. Uh, they say that usually uh, E. coli, proteus, or uh, uh, you know, uh, gram, uh, negative streptococci are the culprits. Uh, patient uh, usually can have some immunocompromised status, diabetes mellitus, uh, and and this will require actually a very aggressive management. You know, because many a times we don't come through these patients and uh, we kind of don't foresee it. So uh, what they say that, uh, uh, and, and what we did is we, we did swab of this patient and there was a heavy growth of E. coli in all the wood. Uh, and rightly said, we did a thorough debridement. Uh, we had around four or five procedures in this patient with debridement, 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 and ultimately saline dressing, and ultimately uh, a, a healthy granulating wood. And, Around four or five, uh, around three sessions, I think, three sessions of skin grafting, uh, and ultimately uh, the wound started healing. 
uh, and, hyperbaric you can consider yeah. if it's a problem yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, hyperbaric is a good suggestion uh, we were lucky that the flap survived you know the flap was kind of floating in between sutures were <laughs> all the side and uh, with all this adversities uh, our cemented flap you know kind of we, i i will say that pmmc is sometimes rcc it doesn't budge even to the infection so <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> yes but we've had a patient who had uh, yeah. rib osteomyelitis after a pec major harvest exactly like this was fasciitis then it became deeper and deeper and then we had to debride like part of the rib yeah. and we had to use opposite pec major like how we do for you know a chest wall closures we had to use the opposite pec major and try and close it so it's not uh, i guess it's not that uncommon but we have to be very careful i guess yes yes so we have to be very careful so, i think so the neck looks one, like to be neck yeah. looks like to be primary closure yes so yes it's a graft on the neck no no it it came primarily Okay. Yeah. One observation. Yeah, uh, it's actually a very huge flap that you have harvested. Right. And I would say one small observation that comes from the fact that whenever we take a large paddle and the yeah. skin that is actually planned over the pectoral area, we should realize that the most of the skin which is supplied to the chest is. the area where the free border of the pec major is there there we get the maximum supply to the skin overlying that mm -hmm. so if we orient the pedal of the large flaps transversely rather than obliquely the two things will not corroborate to each other one the area which is left behind will not become devascularized and the flap that is taken to the reconstruction site would also have a better supply that is my observation with all the large flaps that i have done i find it that if you orient it transversely and you may go well beyond the anti axillary line almost up to 5 to 7 cm they do pretty well even in the large size and that is to do with the supply that you get from the free border of the pec major muscle and sandeep right. so the so other important thing is if you, if you keep it transversely uh, because of the length and breadth ratio you can take some more of the rectus the yes. skin on the rectus also yeah so yeah Yes. So it gives you a wider flap also if you need to do that. So, so kind of, of yeah. So yeah, I think the modification of must have been some ischemia which actually made the organisms become subservient in that area and it became a necrotizing fasciitis. Yes, sir. The pro the issue was that it was at the both the sides, you know, at the neck also, at the chest also. Okay. So I think uh, uh, the take home message is that you have to keep a high index of suspicion. They look for the immune suppression if there is any. You have to act really fast because it is a rapidly spreading. You know, we waited for two days just by doing the dressing, and it actually spreaded a lot. Use culture uh, if required. Use histopathologist. Ask your microbiologist to look for atypical infection and give fast uh, kind of a broad spectrum antibiotics to start with. Hit with the hardest uh, uh, available instrument or available antibiotic you have, and then you downgrade your antibiotics. if required according to culture sensitivity you need to monitor nutritional support of patient also because patient can go in generalized sepsis also and that can actually complicate the entire thing so i think a high index of suspicious and uh, rapid action is required in this kind of uh, flaps or this kind of problems uh donor site morbidity uh, deepak has said a lot about this i think uh, we have a rich donor and then it gives and gives and gives and we rip it off and then we end up like you know this uh, beggar kind of a donor and uh, as uh, we rightly discussed it you know deepak mentioned all the problems which can happen with uh, wound breakdown and skin graft loss and delayed wound healing and all the problems uh, which uh, uh, you can have with this radial forearm flap uh, so uh, 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 when 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 i went to the literature about this donor site morbidity issues in uh, radial forearm free flap one thing which i uh, really came across is that not only leaving the area open and putting the skin graft is the only problem many instances where it happens that you have raised the flap in a bad way you have actually inflicted injuries while raising the flap to the donor area and which actually causes a significant part of donor site morbidity 
so uh, uh, deepak can you enumerate that what care you should take uh, while you are raising your uh, radial forearm free flare to reduce the morbidity so i think the most important thing is to do a suprafacial dissection just until you come to the pericle and preserve not only the paratenon but also some fascia over the paratenon and uh, you have to be very careful when you're handling the skin over the tendon so i guess tendon exposure happens when the tendon is bare and doesn't have any paratenon on it and uh, second is when you're closing you've got to make sure that there is no bleeding uh, there is no chance of hematoma formation under and you have to keep the that see you have to handle the donor site in as uh, as a sterile way as possible you know many a times you have to you don't remember to change the gloves you don't remember to irrigate the wound bed before you close the wound bed uh, so you've got to uh, take care of those things so preserve the uh, the fascia above the tendons do a suprafacial dissection try to keep the bed dry for the the graft to take securing the graft not only in the in the periphery but also in the bed is important and the graft should be supple it shouldn't be a very taut graft that is tenting up and then a you know bolster dressing or a tie over dressing would help and uh, the thing is <clears throat> I, i this is what i've realized that all these grafts look fine till like the fifth day sixth day it's only when the patient start moving the tendons that it tends to shear up so you've got to you know limit in some way their wrist flexion and extension also for some time uh, so all of these things will and obviously like systemic factors like diabetes and you know poor glycemic control all of those also contribute to poor graft take so keep the area clean wash it well before putting the graft avoid uh, fascial disruptions uh, you know secure your graft properly and try to limit the movement of the wrist for a few more days after the graft has taken up right deepak uh, deepak you will use a very thin graft like split thickness or you will use a thickness graft i mean cosmetically you can use an intermediate uh, thin graft you know not a totally thin split skin graft but you can use an intermediate graft because that cosmetically gives better reasons but the take rate is going to be less so a thin skin graft is fine uh, but uh, you just make sure that the skin graft is secured to the bed and the most important thing is i have noticed a lot of the people you have to put an ulnar gutter splint an ulnar gutter splint is extension at the wrist and flexion distally so you have to put an ulnar gutter splint because that is what brings the bed of the of the forearm to contact with the graft i have seen a lot of people who put the uh, the the splint in the neutral yes, position or a flex position if you try that with your own hand you'll realize if you keep the uh, the the slab in a you know you know the the cast in a flex position there's a tent between the brachioradialis and the and the bed of the forearm so you've got to see that make sure that your slab also is placed properly in the ulnar gutter splint uh, style so you've got to do that right deepak uh, i think that ulnar gutter splint uh, point is really important and uh, usually you just give a flat splint and and uh, that uh, that, well, that that will cause a big gap to form between the tendon and the no no, the, no. The you, uh, what we do is we give an ulnar splint you want to give this movement so this this position is the position that we give a plaster it's a slab given and then you tie over it and the slab is given up to here and then you remove it after your first dressing after about 5 to 7 days and then you can have some sort of a compression over there like a thread bandage or an stretcher something yes ma'am so that helps to stabilize it much better And I totally superficial. Always and keep the tissues wet all the time because you forget to irrigate the tissues and tissues or paratin on the tissues really dries up. Any one of you have used expanders before uh, raising the flap or uh, after uh, the flap to close it uh, with skin? Anybody of you has used it? So that will be in a that will be in a non malignancy case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So has used it. there's there's another technique of closing the radial forearm you can use an ulnar advancement flap it is actually yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 that is for very limited areas yeah. not if, a very yeah. big flap if the flap is you can do a sort of a big transposition big transposition flap from the ulnar side but that is for a very uh, not very big flap it's a very small flap ma'am transverse very small flap yeah. yeah so yeah. Uh, can, can that you can shift it like a rotation flap you shift it and close it primarily 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, Amrita, I think. Or a clap like that. Uh, yeah. Shake. Or a clap like that. Exactly, exactly. This, I, I think. Yes. Uh, uh, Suraj had ha, had uh, this kind of presentation from Amrita. If I am, I remember right, Deepak. It has yes, been the it, shape it, modified radial forearm. It has yes, been published I, in uh, published recently in uh, head and neck. Head and neck. We just last this last month, this right. month or last month. Right. So so what would be the maximum width you can take with this kind of uh, design? Whatever you can close primarily by pinching. Okay. Yeah. And two then you double the width and calculate the length and so. Usually two centimeters. Two centimeters. Right. So uh, I think uh, Danushya, you also uh, kind of used certain techniques for that. Will you like to elaborate on that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, I would like to say that uh, even though the literature says that uh, the weight of the graph loss is 10 to 12 percent, but uh, fortunately we le we have less likely to see the graph loss than 5 percent in spite of the operating uh, more than 150 uh, radial active forearm plus per year. Uh, already, uh, Deepak sir already uh, stated that and uh, nicely uh, elaborated uh, all the techniques and uh, uh, development uh, followed by the limb elevation and splint. But uh, a very opt question, which I have always had in my mind, that can we avoid this type of complication? Or if answer is yes, then how? So we decided to work on it. And uh, may I take an op this opportunity to present uh, to you all that our technique of modified Tomberg flap, which we are employing in the defect of the eight centimeter into five centimeter size of the donor site, the radio from, and we have been successfully in achieving primary closure of all such defects of FRAP donor site. This result submitted as an article in IJPS and uh, under process of acceptance. Our main aim or uh, motto is to effort to reduce or eliminate donor site morbidity, which I think improve the quality of life of the patients. So uh, this is my results, uh, uh, which I'll show this over here. Uh, so uh, of donor site. Uh, so, uh, uh, Prabhav, uh, so Danusha says that he will be able to close around eight centimeter by five centimeter defect with this. Uh, That's the patient. Yeah, this, uh, I, and, and I think he has a series of around 20 odd patients now. Uh, and and uh, it has. Yes. Very, very good. Very good. Dushin, this is almost similar to a like a ulnar rotation flap. You know, you go all yeah, the way is, up. It, yeah, it, exactly. It, it is, is a, it is ulnar rotation flap. Yeah, it is ulnar rotation, rotation flap. flap. Rotation flap. Yes. The only problem is sometimes if you have a problem with this, you create a much bigger donor site. You know that is we have. You know we had, uh, I think, uh, successful few cases. One failure made us rethink about it. No, I mean, your donor side becomes necrosis of that thing, then you add up the donor side very badly. No, it is good. If you work, it's excellent. And excellent. when you when you look at it, the when you raise the flap, you get worried. The whole forearm is raised. Yeah. On that thing. So let us move to the dehiscence the and resultant defects that uh, we always don't get all the flaps work fine. You know, they work good intraoperatively. They work good postoperatively also for some time. And then you start having some dehiscence and some port holes, which kind of are troubling. So these are two cases which we have. First case on the left side is of a bilobed pectoralis major flap for an composite defect of mandibulectomy and maxillectomy. Patient was doing well, patient received radiation. Post-artery. Post there was an dehiscence. On the right side is an ALT flap. Patient was doing good, patient was having everything fine and post-artery suddenly you have a gap, entire flap drops down and you have this ugly looking defect which is kind of bothering. So uh, uh, to start with, I think uh, Amit, can you can you tell me something that while you are planning your flap, will you will you uh, take certain measures in planning of your flap that uh, that can kind of take care of the problems? We need to assess the full defect 
means both the inner and the outer defect and the soft tissue required. And even if you are planning for another flap, uh, for such a means high defect, then the local flap is going to be a big challenge. So if you plan for a free flap, then we need to work up for the vessels. So I think uh, very importantly said that you need to uh, see the dimension of the flap. What usually we do is that we measure the inner measurement, outer measurement. But this type of flap goes way down from in to out. And there is a significant distance which we, the flap has to travel from intraorally to extraorally. You need to add that dimension to the flap. You need to add extra flap which you may deepethalize and put inside. Uh, uh, the zygote. I don't know these things works or not, but uh, at least a smaller flap will uh, cause uh, bigger problems. Uh, Dr. Prabha, ma'am, can you add to that? No, the one with the bipedal PMNC, that is, I think already the upper limit of or the PMNC is the limit is too high up. It is, I am surprised that it would study with the radiation if we could finish the radiation. Otherwise, Reaching up to zygoma, I think you are expecting a little too much from the PMMC. That may just drag down with the gravity, its weight. And this is an unsupported inside, maybe post RT that has just given way. So you need to have a support. You can't have a uh, depth which is not, uh, the two flaps which are not supporting each other. The outer one is likely to break down. That must be the problem in the, and your intraoral defect may be at the palatal level, your outer defect is at or reaching the zygoma. So there is a differential uh, inset. That is one reason for this case. And for the ALT, I think whenever you are giving a bipedal ALT, somewhere, wherever there is a bone, I think you need to hitch it to some tissue over there, make a drill hole and anchor your flap over there. Otherwise, again, same thing, post RT, the scar will stretch and it will break down. I think that could and uh, support the depth, what is there, the tissue can be filled up in the cavity. So With the uh, ALT, it is possible. Yeah. So what happens, uh, what we have seen or what everybody might have experienced is that when you suture the skin, the skin is good. And at time when you are taking your ALT, let, let, you are tempted to take more muscle, which you will feel inside the infratemporal fossa uh, at the time of inset primarily. But... Uh, slowly down the line, when the patient receives the radiation, the muscle itself shrinks down. No, and you don't have to, you don't have to take muscle. Your ALT flap itself will have the bulk. You can deepethalize some part and bury that. Okay, so so, so that will last longer than any muscle that you will take along. Exactly. So to, it is better to put a deepethalized portion of ALT in front yeah. of the side. Because denervated so, muscle will always atrophy and will just uh, reduce. It. Yes, exactly. And uh, the and first phase that we even say it was too high of a defect, I think. Right. Yeah. So we kind of, too much from the PMMC. We we aimed the stars and then dropped down. <laughs> yeah. Deepak, you would like to add anything else? I mean, I agree with ma'am said this uh, anything reaching the zygoma is not a good idea for a pec major. And um, uh, you can see the ALT, uh, you can use the DFLIS portion, you can uh, take a large flap and stuff it in and then obliterate all the dead space and uh, it's not dependent on gravity also so it removes all the problems that the scar is going to have post-op and to correct the situation now i really don't know because how how far is he mm -hmm. off after radiation uh, so this patient uh, the first patient is almost completed radiation you can see the scabs around still and the red uh, darkness around uh, this one. Yes. Uh, this patient, the ALT one, is one and a half years after the radiation. So he is kind of knocking our door every week and says that you were telling that after a, after a year of radiation, you will do something. And we don't have answer. He still, he still has erythema. And he still has erythema of the skin. The How is this? How is this intraoral uh, situation? So intraorally, this second patient has a very small fistula. I mean, this is this is uh, the near the zygoma. That's the PMNC patient. Yes. Huh. So the how is the intraoral parietal behaving? 
PMMC patient has good intraoral, both both the patient has good intraoral pain, so, but at the palate, okay. yeah. Then either you require some flap only to cover it to fill it up, or if they are willing, if your prosthetic department is good, they can be some prosthetic shell from outside just for the time being till you are waiting for the reaction to settle down. A prosthetic retention, if there is good, I don't know how the prosthesis is going to retain here. With that, he's See, there is a big there is a big cavity there. Yes, ma'am. So they can take the undercut or sort of an adhesive type of adhesive so, type. Adhesive for that. Here too, we can the other one ALT. I think after some time, if you wait, you may be able to advance that flap or shift something from the forehead or this. Forehead is uh, probably the option for both. I think if they've come to surgery, I mean, if the plan is for surgery. Yeah. Uh, the problem is that uh, in this ALT patient, even this external is sacrificed. Okay. So and temporal is be an option here, uh, just to consider yes, temporal is muzzle to kind of. No, no. So the external carotid was taken. Has lost uh, uh, coronoid also. Uh, it is the temporalization is cut. It was an appearance there. And it's maxilla also done, na? partly. So no. you must have tied in my internal maxillary also. Yes. So the, your temporal muscle supply is gone. Yes, yes. So superficial temporal is gone. Temporal muscle supply is also gone. We don't have any immediate tissue which we can so Then if you just want to cover it, uh, you can shift and pedicle median forehead flap a little extended one. Okay. Dushan, can I, I mean, if you... Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, that's like. uh, the other why, side. Why, if, if this patient has completed one and a half year, so maybe two years, this patient we can consider for another uh, ALT flap. You know, we can. You uh, can. Yeah. You and can consider that. Very good uh, cosmesis also by that. Yes. But will be yes. too early for uh, uh, cosmesis. I know. If he is willing for a free flap, nothing like it, but you will have to really dissect out good vessel, recipient vessels on the next one. Because if you have an uh, external carotid and IgV, I think you can do an ALT flap there. That will fill up the cavity also and it will melt. But I think Dushan told that the carotid was ligated in this patient. Yes, external carotid is ligated. Then you may have to go to the opposite side. That will be little, uh, you'll have to a little long pedicle required. Uh, uh, Drag a lot of deeptalized skin under the cheek skin in the next uh, side. Yeah, so. you may have to open up the remaining skin outside and uh, relatively better access to go to the opposite side. Right. And put it there. Yeah, take a very yeah. long ALT, deeptalize a lot of yes. it the next skin. And yes. The distal yes. part comes here. I think that will give good contour also, I guess, in the end. So. Yes, so. that is the best if patient is willing. So I have not seen a third case in this series, but. There, I had done the same thing, but still it dropped down. <laughs> no, so that's what I'm saying. You drill hole somewhere and then hitch it to that bone with a proline or anesthetic. So it may stay and yeah, stop in more so that doesn't cannot drag down, support it over there. Many a times I think that I should give patient head down position for one month. <laughs> so, the other thing you can do is you can deaptalize the ALT flap, take it under the skin of the upper part of the, the defect. Right. And then do a and transfixation suture. Yeah, do a transfixation suture yeah. with proline. Because you that, to the zygote. I'm telling you. Yes, ma'am. The bone support as well as yeah. it takes some more. Guess, yes. Yeah. Higher you can uh, extension of fascia into the yes, subcutaneous space. And yeah. then take transfixation that's sutures right. and then keep it there yes. for a few months. What's going to happen? Right. I think that's the right point that you uh, don't only suture the skin, as Dr. Sandeep also rightly said in his presentation that the soft tissue around the flap also needs to be sutured in a good way uh, to keep the flap in it, that place. I think that's a good point which uh, comes out of it. Uh, this is a peculiar case. Uh, uh, I think it is 8.55, uh, but I think I will take a few cases more if you all are fine with it. Uh, this is a young patient in whom... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 855. So ask the panelists if they want to continue. Yeah, that's what I'm asking actually. Yeah, yeah. no problem. No problem. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we have around 100 plus participants still with us. Uh, so this is the yeah. patient in which we did a fibula research. One, 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 one. So yeah. Yeah. 
uh, and and and, and uh, there was an outer skin defect also. Uh, the patient had some healing issues postoperatively, definitely. Uh, the patient went for the radiation also. After radiation, uh, patient started having uh, a kind of uh, a hard, uh, a hard palpa palpable thing are in the submental area, open fibula flap, uh, and we were kind of worried about this uh, hard issue. You know, we were thinking that it is plate which has broken or what it is. You know, it's malignancy coming back or some node or something. And uh, uh, surprisingly, when uh, uh, I, you know, I will rather I will rather like to ask you people that what this thing can be. You know, this was not malignancy. Uh, this was no. This was not plate. This was not. This was not plate. Not malignancy. This must be the bone from the periosteum which you have left behind. Yeah. Of the uh, when you strip the off the periosteum, some of the periosteum may be hanging down, which has formed the bone. Yeah. Or a broken plate. You said it is not plate. It is not uh, malignancy. So the only other thing can be the periosteum. Yeah, very rightly said, ma'am. That uh, uh, we were dealing with uh, bone formation from the periosteum, oh. which we left on the stripped off uh, pedicle. And uh, yes. uh, though it is not very common, it is not very uncommon also. No. We've had one yes. case exactly the same in the max. We had two, two patients like that. So that's why I guess I don't remember this patient. Yeah. So I remember the army major. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> excellent. Huge. Correct. He, his was, I think, two or three times bigger than, mm -hmm. and we had to drill out that bone because he was complaining of cosmetic problems. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. That is the problem. It's happening here. You know, uh, the issue is that the skin is too thin over it. So if we put an incision and we drill out the bone, I'm just worried that. Uh, will there be any nations of the skin or not? It and is already at, telling you from where it wants to come out. And at the same time, the spur will come out uh, from the skin. It looks like it is tenting the skin. It's telling you from where it wants to come out. Yeah. So Go directly on it, then uh, break it and bring it out. Rather than it comes out, I, I should take it out. No, no. You uh, must be worried about okay. it. Whatever. <laughs> if patient is bothered about you, you take it out. Other than when it comes out, you take it out. Okay, right. So I can even wait uh, uh, and then take it out. If patient is not bothered. Yeah. So uh, there was an article. I did a literature search and uh, we found that uh, there are instances like that where you leave the periosteum. In this article, they did a comparative study of uh, uh, lifting the pedicle with periosteum and lifting the pedicle without periosteum. And in that without periosteum uh, uh, series, there were not uh, uh, bone spurs. And with periosteum, there were seven patients that had bone spurs, which grew afterwards. Uh, so uh, now are the hardware issues. Most of the part, uh, Deepak has kind of uh, covered up the hardware, but we definitely get, this is one which Deepak gave me. And uh, these are the, uh, you know, uh, problems which happens to us after radiation, the skin thins out, thins out and you have uh, hardware which is outside and uh, at the areas of the screws, you have uh, kind of uh, 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 pus coming out. So uh, Deepak, uh, uh, I will uh, extend, uh, I would like to extend your uh, uh, suggestions in that uh, matter that uh, can you do something why you are inserting your flap to avoid this kind of situations? Yeah, the commonest thing you can do is you can utilize part of the skin paddle of the fibula or scapula, whatever you're harvesting, and use it as a second layer over the plate. Right. And then just drape it over the plate and you know suture it down somewhere in the dermis. Right. That will give you an extra bulk. I like the scapula that way because scapular skin is slightly thicker. And then you can really play with the skin a little bit more. But uh, deaptalizing a really thin fibula skin paddle is you'll end up with a very tiny, thin sheet like, you know, paper like uh, uh, layer, which still might be effective. I really don't know. But deaptalize and try to tuck some tissue over the plate. Right. So I think that's a good point that 
usually when you are doing this segment of resection you go very thin on your skin uh, yeah. of your cheek flap and usually that tends over your plate and uh, uh, especially anteriorly it tends and stretches and post radiation you get dehiscence the and then plate exposure uh, uh, so uh, so if this type of things happens post operatively now say in the uh, first patient where he has already completed his radiation around one and a half to two years down the line uh, and still this plate is open and exposed uh, how you will take all this uh, 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 dr ayer what is this flap this is fibula fibula so i would like to look at uh, look at the bone whether it is viable or not mostly it looks like viable it's only the plate exposed mm. in that case uh, i would uh, remove the plate and then at the skin you might need to provide some skin mm. because it's hardly likely to close so maybe a pedicle the uh, supraclavicular uh, or small shift the nasal labial yeah what is maybe shift the nasal labial down nasal Modulation. labial i don't yes. know whether yeah, it will yeah, do yeah it might not yeah you can do but the uh, scar is here so you bring it yeah, down i don't know my yeah. not maybe a supraclavicular or dp type of uh, you know small thing which uh, will cover that and then you can uh, release the pedicle later on might be the best sort of thing. so but what happens when you go inside and put an incision on this uh, you you uh, skin is that uh, the dimension of the defect increases yeah, yeah now your addition uh, the question is are you going to remove the entire plate or not I I I wouldn't, but you see that uh, the the plate in front also the skin is going to dehisce. Yes, yes. And in the chin area, yeah. so I would open up that area and go sl slightly posteriorly and anteriorly take the plate from that area, and then be ready to provide the skin, unless the sometimes you find that. even the epithelialization has occurred beneath the plate behind, behind the plate yes. uh, behind the plate then you leave it you just leave it like that otherwise you will need to akshay you will like to add anything or uh, uh just uh, just looking at these cases i remember ayer uh, sir in the ot4 managing all the complex uh, ca complex cases just a point about uh, reducing the plate exposure our plastic surgeon prashant puranik sir what he does is it takes a chimeric muzzle uh, the soleus muzzle and you uses it to cover on top of the plate especially when we are doing sub follicular kind of uh, uh, resections wow. so that's how we manage this and it becomes little bulky and post radiation it at uh, the profile of the uh, the facial profile uh, fits very nicely because of the muzzle cover uh, over the plate akshay akshay i remember hello ha sir yeah actually i remember uh, talking to puranik and he had presented a case also where he uh, took a chimeric soleus to put in the itf posa or in the uh, because yes, what he had in a in a he had presented in that in your conference only a series yeah, of cases yeah right so basically uh, when you remove the masseter you remove all those tissues there and you put a fibula the mandible is okay but there is a kind of a depression in that area intra zygomatic and where yeah. probably that uh, can help to give you yeah. uh, a contour the only thing i wanted to know whether on a long term basis doesn't that muscle also you know atrophy it atrophy it atrophy it does atrophy but i think it, it over corrects it and uh, uh, reasonably the uh, function i mean the cosmetic appeal is pretty good uh, i have just seen patients like last one and a half years probably 2 3 years down the line if you see you may get yeah. a better idea okay yeah so uh, taking ahead this hardware issues uh, which plates to use mini plates mm -hmm. which thickness which screws recon recon plates weight bearing lodge lodge sharing plates Well, there is a plethora of uh, choices with you, and uh, we had some uh, hard ones with uh, mini plates also, and uh, there was breakage of mini plates and uh, kind of uh, uh, bad experiences. Uh, uh, but but I would like to know from uh, uh, you know Deepak Deepak, uh, what is your principle? What do you use for your uh, uh, fibulas? I mean, in Amrita, we always use reconstruction plates. 
Okay. Uh, because they are load bearing and they are not load sharing planes. And uh, the issue is not whether it's a recon plate or non recon plate, but the size of the plate matters. Because right now, for you know affordable patients, we are using the striker low profile uh, two mm plates. So they have much lesser. Even though the picture that I showed you was the striker plate which was exposed, right. I think moving from a two point five plate to a two plate makes a lot of difference uh, from a plate exposure point of view. And these low profile plates tend not to tent out into the skin and things like that. So I would, I think, Amrita policy has always been to use a reconstruction plate, uh, and then um, uh, use a low locking. profile plate if possible. It should be a locking plate with uh, screws. So, uh, but I, having said that, I've seen a lot of good results of people using CAD CAM and then using multiple mini plates to fix it. And there's always this argument in literature which is better. They have their advantages and disadvantages, both of them. But our principle has been always to use the reconstruction plate. Right. Uh, uh, Prabhavan, uh, what about uh, your experience? See, if the patient can afford a recon plate, because nowadays you get a low profile recon plate with locking screws. So previously used to have a very thick recon plate. That is that you would always get exposed and then to remove that is an hell of a job if it gets exposed. Okay. So that is now you get a very low profile recon plate which you can use. Otherwise, mini plates are good enough because you don't really move them. But sometimes these mini plates do fracture. That's the I mean depends on the company what company sometimes you use the plates and screws. Sometimes they fracture and then you have a problem. That is there. But otherwise, mini plates we use quite a lot. Mini plates, at least in Dhaka, because money constraint used to be there, so the mini plates will cost little less than a recon plate. Okay. But so, given a choice, a low profile recon plate with locking screws. So I, I remember that when uh, uh, we had few issues with mini plates like fracture, etc., we went to yes. the company. And uh, when we asked their experts, they said that these plates are not for your, uh, not for this role. You know, they are for the small facial fractures where the bone segment is pretty stable. Uh, so I think uh, that makes a lot of sense not to use these plates and wherever possible, use low profile yes. plates. Uh, Sanjay, what about you? So uh, one more thing is that uh, uh, when you use this fibula flaps, when you start your mouth opening exercises, do you do it aggressively? Uh, uh, do you ask patient to chew everything? They do active exercise kind of therabyte or orabyte, or uh, if yes, when, if no, till what time they should not do any mouth opening exercise? Because post-operative with Christmas is also a big problem in this patient. Uh, so, uh, Amit, uh, I would like to ask you that what is your protocol for this fibula patients, mouth opening exercises? Uh, once the wound heals, uh, most of these patients we put into, means not the aggressive mouth opening, but chewing, we start on chewing. But terabyte, we are not, um, most of the patient who can afford, then we can, we prefer to give terabyte. But at least for around, when the wound heals till around six weeks, after six weeks, then we tell them to do, do stretching exercises. So in six weeks is, uh, yeah, you in, don't in, six weeks. And in those patients only in which we have manipulated the uh, mesetric spaces. Yeah. So, Mia, your, uh, your practice? Um, I, again, uh, when wound healing is, uh, I think from first visit to the OPD onwards, we start counseling them or we send them to the uh, speech therapist. Those are the people who uh, teach them, sorry, the occupational therapist who teach them to use the key which is given for mouth opening. And as in when the patient gets comfortable, you know, the pain reduces, they are a little more comfortable with things, uh, they start using it. We do not restrict them that till this particular day, you're not supposed to do mouth opening exercise or any such sort Okay. Deepak, uh, what about uh, Amrita Protocol? I mean, uh, we give the mouth opening exercises as a prophylaxis for radiation, I think, considering the radiation is what's going to cause the Christmas. 
so i would probably wait for 6 weeks uh, because by 6 weeks the bones also will start to unite and uh, you know i think 6 weeks would be an ideal time we don't have a routine practice like that it's only for the radiation we start to get so it's kind of an uh, just an uh, physiological mouth opening or you use some devices or you allow use of devices no, if it's if it's during radiation and we know that the patient is going to have impending trismus then you use an appliance to keep the mouth open that is fine okay. but prior to that they'll be on a soft diet and you slowly upgrade the soft diet to a semi solid diet over a course of few weeks mm. but uh, then the terabyte begins after that Uh, if you have a level of Christmas before surgery, and if you have possibly opened the mouth on table, I think the patient needs to start exercises maybe about two to three weeks after surgery because fibula will heal like a fractured mandible. Yes. So the fractured mandible usually heal within three weeks time. Hmm. So you can start those exercises, whatever physiologically he can open, let him open and try and open. And then he starts after two to three weeks. He starts the jaw stretching exercises. He has an adequate dentition behind. Because yes. if you start just before radiation, nothing is going to work. Because by that time, what you have torn open will again become much fibrous, and it will be too tight a mouth. Post RT, so you don't expect them to open afterwards because RT is a bad period for them to do too much exercise. So before they go for RT, I think they should have a good mouth opening. What they should maintain it. the regulation that's my philosophy so i think a great uh, point because uh, many reconstructive surgeons are kind of worried about their plates and bones and everything no. so delay the mouth opening exercises which is actually wrong you know which will actually uh, deny the patient the mouth opening which fibula uh, uh, will uh, give them you know so it is better to start them early Uh, in fact i tell them that you need to do it every hour five to six times throughout the day only in sleep they will not do it that's the only thing okay then only, think, then only it will open a great deal of mouth opening uh, has to do with reinforcement of the idea the extensive counseling that madam gives each patient and whom uh, you know what we have actually started repeating what she used to say, tell patients that even when you're sitting outside my opd you should have that key in your pocket and yeah. you know you should be continuously doing the exercise that constant reinforcement each time an opd visit happens should occur uh, i think that's a great point even in our oral cavity panel there was unanimous uh, voice that uh, post operatively mouth opening exercise are very important start as early as possible and do it aggressively and uh, everybody needs to uh, uh, remember this uh the next case uh, i think must be the last yes. case uh is the patient with vitiligo uh somehow i don't know i have uh, bad luck with vitiligo patients or everybody has it but this was the patient where we had a lip defect and there was a dysplastic mucosa at upper lip we did a small stg for it and uh, a nasolabia for the lower lip and i don't have the pictures of uh, the necrosis but uh, on the fourth or fifth day the distal tip of the flap started necrosis and uh, we had a bad defect patient didn't want to do anything else and the patient went home but that was not the end of the story the same patient came to me with uh, a bad left buccal mucosa recurrence now i didn't have any choice i had to do an alt flap a bilob alt on the third or fourth day uh, the inner pedal was fine the outer pedal started necrosis at the periphery and uh, so uh, the surrounding skin also started having inflammation and all around it this is not the only case i have uh, in all the vitiligo patients we had some point of problem at healing problems or uh, vessel problems or kind of partial necrosis of flap and everything so i would like to ask the panel that uh, with this uh, uh, patients with autoimmune disease or vitiligo or sle Uh, do you find some problems in healing or flaps uh, uh subu sir which will i go so far no mm-hmm. sle yes sle yes and then uh, okay. other okay. things mainly vasculitis can lead to so you have to be careful little i go I, if i remember yeah. correctly nothing has been so badly you know i don't know whether uh, 
I can't comment because it's, it has not visited uh, me. Okay. Anybody else will like to give any suggestions? Suggestion regarding? Uh, any other experience they have with Vitiligo or SLE? SLE, uh, yes. can, you can expect a problem. So try and avoid. But uh, Vitiligo, we have done few cases. We didn't have any problem. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, uh, we will take some some uh, last cases where uh, you you find that uh, there is a flap which will kind of meet your need and it immediately may meet your need also. But uh, down the line, you find that you were aiming for a full pant and you are having a half pant in your hands. Uh, so these are the cases where even Deepak uh, shared with me. I think this is a patient where there was a fibula and there was a bulk of uh, uh, flap also was required, but one flap was done and it was. It seems like it was not enough. In this case, uh, it was a good defect. Uh, we did a marginal mandibulectomy and uh, uh, the flap which we placed there, you know, just vanished off after some time of radiation. Again, uh, here is an maxilla patient where an LT was done. And it, it looks to us that uh, we did good initially, but down the line, uh, uh, we were not able to give the optimum result to the patient. Uh, in this type of scenarios, you know, kind of a single flap is not fine or the flap doesn't behave good afterwards, radiation all, uh, it doesn't give a good contour, good cosmesis, good function. Uh, any suggestions? Do we do uh, two flaps in these patients? Uh, how to take up this situation? Uh, Soumya? So, irrespective of how well we have planned uh, preoperatively and intraoperatively, what radiation does to these flaps is quite unpredictable most of the times. Um, what type of radiation these patients receive also, at least in our practice, we can't determine it because for radiotherapy, the patient usually goes back to their hometown. They can get anything from a cobalt to a well-studied uh, IMRT radiation that these patients get. So, of course, uh, we need to look at the defect in a three-dimensional manner and not just the mucosal defect and the skin defect, but also look at the uh, soft tissue deficit that's there and plan accordingly. And that's what you can do. And uh, But... Even then, sometimes you do encounter these unfortunate situations. And uh, of course, uh, you need to be honest with the patient and have a conversation with them about how willing they are for a second surgery to change this contour deformity. Send these patients to your uh, prosthetic department to see if they can help them in some way. If not, in male patients at least, we have done uh, scalp flaps where the donor site is hidden and, you know, the hair bearing area, they sort of cover it up by growing a beard. And a lot of patients have been very happy with that uh, outcome. But uh, yes, it's a difficult problem is what it is. Dr. Ayer, you would like to add something? I would, uh, I would uh, always uh, look at the soft tissue. Like uh, Sandeep was saying about the, uh, initially that uh, we all concentrate on the bone, but we, we pay little attention to the soft tissue requirement, which is very pertinent. Now, if you want to do a double flap, you have to do it. You cannot stretch a single flap to go this way and that way and reach, give you the best contour. So there, if you want to have a good result, you have to have a less threshold for a second flap. The second flap need not be a free flap, need not be. Uh, when we started, we have, we published also a large series of double free flaps and then huge and we series and huge. But off late, our second free flap is either DP flap or a supraclavicular flap, which gives a much better, uh, you know, color, uh, match. Uh, color match to the face. So, need not be second free flap. You, you pectoralis major, DP or supraclavicular will fill in that, uh, fill in that uh, you know, role of a second free flap. But I'm not saying that second free flap should not be done. It should be done in certain cases where radial forearm with a, uh, you know, or ALT with a fibula or radial forearm with ALT, you uh, know, fibula is good. But don't mince your uh, 
don't be stingy in your soft tissue that hmm. is the reason why you end up with this defect see wherever there is a third dimension that comes in correct yeah. so fibula can never fill up that third dimension which goes to the like muscle exactly. and everything exactly. yeah. so that correct. third dimension your second flap has to come correct i mean you need to calculate as you go laterally your third dimension goes on increasing yeah. so if that flap is not able to uh, is adequate yeah. then maybe uh, but you should take that decision well in advance during the surgery that you require a second flap flap you don't start it at the end of the surgery my god my mind required to go yeah, 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 correct i think so uh, that decision can be taken early in the morning when you are doing the first flap flap so i think it is it is in the planning phase that you see the habitus of the patient some patients have very yes. thin lower limb and yes. you are actually over stretching your limits while you are doing uh, this kind yes. of reconstruction so you need to plan and you need to in advance counsel the patient also yeah. about the need and that is that is the best time to do it because the neck is virgin you have all the vessels now to go after post rt and operative site then it is little more riskier than when you do it for primary when the whole neck is open and all fresh vessels are there right right sir uh so uh nitin uh, ashay we have questions no sir almost all questions are answered during our discussion great we had no great. any open question who is kind of uh 922 and still on and uh, yes. uh so i i think it was a great discussion great panel and uh, a lot yeah. of your take home messages uh, uh and, yeah yeah can i say one thing yes. uh, i yes. don't know how everybody does the monitoring of flap but our standard is an prick method that you see the bleed whether you do a doppler the doppler signal is there or not we i will prick the flap and see the bleed and you will scratch it or prick it scratch it or i'll prick it okay. because scratch me you a little bigger scar if the prick doesn't give me bleed then i'm worried then i'll scratch it but uh, i'll do one on table that's my baseline right so that is whether it is bright red fast it is bright red slow so you can compare it post operatively Right. Other is suddenly one person has seen it in on table and one person is afterwards and he says no it's very slow then you get worried sitting at home that something has gone wrong so that thing uh, one need to mention ma'am uh, ma'am and that... the neck neck and the neck position what neck position you want what not to that's very important right uh, uh, sir uh, can I ask one question sir to ma'am sir yes yes please. yeah uh, ma'am how many days uh, you are going to do this method the prick method uh, four uh, five days No, no. About forty. See, first forty-eight hours is important. After that, I expect less problems. So then my vigilance reduces. Then it may be twice a day or thrice a day, not uh, not more than that. I see no. So the minimum problems will happen in forty-eight hours. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I see no third day. I don't want to do a prick because I see the hair on that side. So yeah, that is one way of you are seeing a growth. That's good. So that means the flap is viable, no? Otherwise, the other the hair will not grow. That's fine. Right. Thank so you. I think uh, the clinical judgment of uh, uh, flaps, color, turgor, and your screen scratch is the best gold standard right now. Whatever else you have, kind of Doppler or sonography or whatever fancy devices you have, substantiate your clinical judgment. But it is not uh, something on which you can rely on. uh so that's the take home message uh the entire uh discussion and entire concept is to discuss your complications and come out you know why we have kept this six series on six as complication because we are kind of uh, uh, living in our own world we don't want to confront our complications or we don't want to discuss our complications and i will say that uh, this discussions and confrontation is a great learning tool Dushan sir, uh, yeah. Uh, can I ask any uh, one question? Yes, yes. Why not? Uh, uh, to uh, Prabha ma'am, uh, does we have anything like delayed bleeding while scratching the flap? If you see there is a delayed bleeding, yeah. Is sometimes it happens. No, no. See, it is how fast the bleeding comes. Sometimes we feel that if you scratch it now, you go see other patient, then the bleeding will come. It's like that. So sometimes it is slow. So that's why I'm saying on table when you prick it, that the first prick of the day. 
so that you monitor and it should be comparable to that bleed there are such few flaps sometimes they don't immediately bleed they take their own sweet time to have the small bright red but it is bright red that comes it does happen sometimes not routinely but then you get a little worried that there is no bleed so if when you see a flap where there are multiple scratches on the flap or the pricks that means there is always a doubt that something is are not right with the flap when you see so many scratches on the flap you are not getting the bleed so then you need to be little careful in seeing that patient and i think you need to be uh, careful in scratching and pricking it repeatedly also because yes. it causes subdermal hematoma and and yes. false impression so try to do it at the a little closer to the margin right. don't the bang in the thing right uh, any tip monitor the radial tube flap for uh, circumferential hypopharyngeal defect any tips from the panelist uh if you can bring out a monitoring paddle into the next skin desirable but if you can't then it is very difficult to see that unless you see the neck drain or the reaction of the skin on the next skin but by the time you detect that if something dead is there the skin will become inflamed or indurated by the time it is late to salvage so i would like to bring out a paddle of skin outside uh, into the next skin at the lower end where you need to deepithelize but you need to take into account the deepithelize segment or you can divide it a segment of it and bring it out otherwise the deepithelial segment can pull that your inner suture line and cause an osteo a leak over there so that you need to be careful but that is i am comfortable if i can bring it out and monitor it we we had a kind of a implantable doppler device with us for some time yeah if you have that that is fine but, but if you like, don't have it i would rather like to tell that we had bad experience with that doppler device oh. the sleeve of the doppler device which goes on that vessel uh oh. in three of my flaps it kinked the vessel so okay. the flap died because of doctor rather than uh, otherwise so I, I, in those buried flap i started uh, I, i started that using doctor we did around 25 cases but then because of this reason we stopped using that doctor uh, so now i have actually used the cooks color doctor the, the cooks doppler cooks doppler yeah doctor doppler uh, during fellowship we never had the problem with it compressing the vessel maybe uh, i don't know um, and uh, one thing about the pedicle when it is too long or too circuitous we said that we will stitch it somewhere or clip it somewhere but sometimes that spot itself becomes like an spot to yeah. for the kid yeah. so what i do is nowadays i lay the vessel how i want it then put and cut out of our uh, uh, glove on it and put a saline uh, gospis over it and put the skin over it do the rest of the some work by the time you come back you take out the gospis and this your thing gets uh, glued to the bed so it is one top type of ironing that you don't have to then fix it by any stitch or any clip i mean in a korea or somewhere they spray a uh, fibrin glue spray so that the thing stays in one place so this is one way of doing that you put it in position that you want put an uh, glove cut out glove and to the wet gauze piece so where because if you don't put a glove while removing the gauze piece you will again dislodge that position what you have so that really works very well right so sometimes uh, uh, over it surgical or a kind of a small sleeve of surgical yes yes you can lay down a full surgical over it over the bed that makes it stick very well yeah so uh thank you everybody it was a great panel great discussions and great take home messages uh, i thank entire panel uh, for staying for such late and i uh, still we have a good number of participants who are also very much uh, active on the chat box and interestingly uh, listening to all of us uh, i welcome you all to our next session that is the last and final session Uh, on salivary glands and ORN that will be on the 15th of the August, the Independence Day, and we have Dr. Jatin Shah, Dr. Kuria Kos, Abhishek Vaidya, Alok Thakkar, Dr. Jyoti Dabolkar, Dr. Kinjal Jani, Rajesh Kantharia, Saurav Dutta, and Vikram Kekatpure for that final uh, uh, panel. So thanks again, everybody, and uh, it was great day. But, uh, this uh, uh, entire series is available uh, on the website also. Uh, 
uh, where all the recording of uh, all the uh, sessions till now are there and they will remain there. So you can go back there and refresh if you want. Uh, thank you all and good night. Good night, all of you. Take care. Congratulations, Lucian, for doing this. Thank you, Very good. Very good initiative. Well done. Thank you so much.